You feel the panic, making your temperature rise like chili oil on the tongue as you race down an alleyway, narrowly avoiding the carnage unfolding all around you. Ducking behind a wall, you press your back against the brick, hoping that if you maybe just stay still, you'll avoid getting caught in the crossfire. War has come to the streets of this small New York town, but it is unlike any conflict you could have ever imagined. The township of Aglo hasn't just been turned into a war zone, it's a calzone. Staring at you on the opposite wall of the alleyway are posters overlapping posters, all of the exact same advertisements for the Aglo Hot Slice. They're everywhere, covering the whole wall with scrawled lettering hand drawn over each one that reads, All hail Kevin Aglo Hot Slice loves you, join us, eat, 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 come be with us, come be with us, we love you. It's like a nightmare that you can't wake up from, everything around you serving up a reminder that you're in deep dish, and any moment now, you'll be dead meat. Taking a deep breath to steady yourself, you grip your camera in your trembling fingers, removing the lens cap and holding on tight as you peer out from the alleyway to snap some shots of the front lines. The world needs to know about this mayhem, all the lives lost and marinara spilled in a senseless exchange of violence. The lens brings the moving shapes down the street into focus, but you still can't believe that they're real. The soldiers of this war aren't human, not all of them at least. You distinctly remember seeing two human combatants, the leaders of these warring factions. One of the foot soldiers is clashing with an enemy, a homunculus almost in the vague shape of a person facing off against a metallic mass armed with circular blades. As your finger presses the shutter, you capture the closing moments of their fight, the homunculi swinging a large formless arm, almost like it's made out of a lump of clay, missing hands and fingers of its own, trying to use brute strength against its metal opponent. The next shot shows the metallic creature slicing through the homunculus with deadly, practiced efficiency, leaving nothing but a pile of dough and cheese, leaking thick, goopy marinara sauce onto the asphalt. You lower your camera, tears streaming down your face, as you look around and see scenes like that unfolding all around you. They're fighting in every building, on every street corner. The thunder of artillery strikes and explosions from crashing drones are deafening. War is hell, and now you've seen that for yourself firsthand. But while your attention is fixated on the horrors of bread and cheese-based warfare erupting all around you, you don't notice a hulking pizza creature lumbering behind you, ready to strike. Welcome to Aglo, New York, ground zero in a war unlike any other, a conflict that the SCP Foundation has designated as SCP-4201. Like any war, it's important to know who the key players are, what the inciting incidents were that triggered it, and what deep-seated ideological differences are being fought over. It's a war between two pizza restaurants. Oh really? Well that sure seems a little half-baked. I oh, didn't like that one. Too cheesy for you. <laughs> ah. In that case, pop some lactose tablets and grab a slice of the action, ready to understand exactly how and why these two rival businesses turn to enemies, duking it out on the battlefield. Do you remember the 23rd night of September? Because that's when the municipality of Aglo, New York welcomed a brand new eatery to its humble township. Their local paper, the Aglo Herald, was on the scene to report on the grand opening of the Aglo Hot Slice, a new pizzeria established by local resident Kevin Kelderbert. Now you might not think that the opening of a new pizza place would be all that newsworthy, but for one, not much happens in Aglo, New York, and for another, what made this a notable occurrence for the locals was that the opening of the Aglo Hot Slice put the fledgling pizzeria in the crosshairs of a local staple. Mario's Pizza della Delicioso. History would come to know the 23rd night of September 1997 as the day the first shot was fired in a war that would consume Alglo in flames like a wood-burning oven. 
For over 35 years, Mario Bianchi's traditional Italian pizzeria had been a local fixture, a homegrown icon, bringing the people of Aglo hand-tossed dough that was wood-fired to perfection and served with a smile. But smiles turned to sour scowls as Kevin Kelderbert opened up the hot slice. Many Aglo residents feared that this challenge to Mario's Pizza del Delicioso would drive business away from the long-standing local favorite. But there was a division of public opinions, with others glad for the arrival of the Aglo Hot Slice and the potential a new pizzeria had to break the monopoly Mario's had on the localized market. For his own part, the founder of the Aglo Hot Slice, Kevin Kelderbert, had no intentions of muscling in on Mr. Bianchi's turf. Kevin lived in Aglo for his entire life and had plenty of fond memories of visiting Mario's to enjoy a slice with his friends back when he was still in middle school. He was nothing but amicable towards the local pizzeria owner and viewed the opening of his hot slice as nothing more than encouraging some healthy, purely professional competition between the two of them. It was Kevin's hope that the competition would encourage both his and Mario's businesses to maintain a consistent quality of their food, and in a sense, he was right. The quality of both their pizzas would certainly be put to the test, not just on the battlefield of Aglo's pizza market, but on the actual battlefield the town would soon become. To begin with, there seemed to be little animosity between Mario and Kevin's competing pizzerias. For both Mario's Pizza della Delicioso and Aglo Hot Slice, business was booming. While Mario had the skills and many more years of experience, he was clearly not threatened by the existence of his new rival, yet. Over his more than three decades in Aglo, Mario had consistently put his other competitors out of business, thanks to the quality of his pizza. He even toppled the local Pizza Hut outlet. So it was clear that he didn't think there was much cause for concern when the Aglo Hot Slice opened its doors. Mr. Bianchi wasn't one to cower from his challenger either. He made a point of trying Kevin Kelderbert's pizza, even complimenting it as the best pizza Mario had ever tasted, from a competitor at least. According to Mario, in an interview he gave with the Aglo Herald, Hot Slice had nothing on his own pizza, and even claimed that Kevin would have to step up his game if he wanted a piece of the local pizza pie. While not exactly an explosive retaliation by Mario Bianchi, the oven glove had certainly been thrown down, and the war to determine who had the strongest pizza was on. Their war wasn't initially one fought with guns and bombs, but their primary weapons in their earliest battles were pizza and advertising. Despite the widespread acclaim his pizza was earning, Kevin simply could not contend with the longevity and positive reputation that Mario's Pizza della Delicioso held in Aglo. He couldn't help that whenever residents thought of pizza, they automatically thought of Mario's. After all, the garlic seasoned veteran had put five other competitors out of business, snuffing them out for good and leaving him as the only pizzeria standing in Aglo. But Kevin was determined, and nowhere was that more apparent in his aggressive marketing campaign for Hot Slice. The entire town seemed to be covered in advertisements for Kevin's pizzeria touting the quality customers could expect from eating there. This seemed to be doing the trick, as within its first week, Aglo's Hot Slice saw around 7,000 customers. Impressive figures when you consider that the town's population was only around 10,000. It was almost as if the entire town was mesmerized by Kevin and his pizza. One advertisement featured in the Aglo Herald even included the quote, it isn't possible for pizza to be perfect attributed to someone who's never tried Aglo Hot Slice. Within the first month of Hot Slice's opening, things started to take a turn for the strange. Although the town of Aglo wasn't exactly known for being a hotbed of extreme weather, the night of October 3, 1997 would have been seen as unusual anywhere else. A freak thunderstorm rolled into Aglo, bringing with it a massive downpour of rain. The force of the storm was actually so great that many locals found that holes formed in their roofs, letting the water come pouring in. But that wasn't even close to the strangest part about the storm. Local meteorologists estimated that there were over 700 individual strikes of lightning that night, with the two most notable locations that were affected being Mario's Pizza della Delicioso 
and the Aglo Hot Slice. The latter, in particular, took a heavy beating during the storm, being struck by approximately 50 lightning bolts. However, it seemed that Kevin had been preparing for the weather despite how unusual it was for the area, almost as if he had been expecting it. He'd installed 20 lightning rods on his property, meaning the damage was kept to a minimum, as were the effects of the storm on Mario's, which remained relatively unscathed. Although it certainly seemed as if the heavens themselves had chosen a side in the ongoing feud between the rival pizzerias. The strange happenings didn't stop with the freak storm either. Later that same month, a pair of local teenagers witnessed something that baffled them both. Strange humanoid creatures in Mario's Pizza della Delicioso. The Aglo police wrote their story off as nothing more than teenage hooliganry, likely fueled by illicit substance use. But the two boys, Jeffrey Aristeel and Justin Copper, stood by their story, regardless of how inexplicable it sounded. While walking around town late one night, the two of them noticed strange movements inside the pizzeria. What first caught their attention was the lights were still on well past 11 o'clock at night, whereas Pizza della Delicioso closes at 9. Checking closer, the pair of teenagers tried the front door only to find, much to their surprise, that it was still unlocked. Stepping inside, Jeffrey and Justin saw Mario Bianchi sitting at one of the booths in his own restaurant, with pizza slices on the table before him. He began lighting candles and placing them around the table, while reciting a strange chant that the boys found incomprehensible. But they continued to watch as he ground up a red chalk-like substance in his hands, then blew the resultant dust over the pizza slices. Given what happened next, it's safe to assume he wasn't trying out a new type of topping. Before the terrified and confused eyes of the two teens, the pizza formed an inhuman creature. It sat up and scanned the room, quickly spotting the pair of intruders, which caused a mouth to form in its head slice. The pizza homunculus screeched at Jeffrey and Justin, causing Mario to get up and start yelling at them both to leave. Two days later, the strange reports surrounding the warring pizzerias continued to circulate, with even more ads for the hot slice plastered all over town. Over the course of what appeared to be a single night, every square foot of space in Aglo was plastered with new advertisements. There was no way that Kevin Kelderbert, acting alone, could have placed that many posters and flyers for his pizzeria in a single night. To make things even stranger, over 70% of the local residents had visited the hot slice since the advertisements were posted, with many of them not coming back out. Staff from the Aglo Herald attempted to investigate, but similarly didn't return, making it impossible for anyone to learn what was truly going on inside. Then, some time after this, it happened. Tensions rose, getting hotter like melting cheese, until war broke out. SCP-4201 is the designation given to the ensuing conflict between Mario's Pizza della Delicioso and the Aglo Hot Slice. Both restaurants possess their own military forces, each deploying differing weapons and tactics that seem to be linked to each different pizzeria's aesthetics and theme. Mario's troops consisted of large, anomalously animated homunculi creatures. Each one was made out of various pizza ingredients, including dough, cheese, and various other toppings made to order. Well, to follow orders. These forces were divided into infantry and cavalry, with their combat style highly similar to that of the Napoleonic War era. Mario's foot soldiers were all armed with bayoneted rifles, while they were supported by cavalry units and artillery. Their commander himself rode into battle on a construct that resembled a horse, however, made out of the same ingredients as the rest of his forces. While leading his military efforts, Mario uses pizza-based abilities to support his troops, apparently gained through the same unknown anomalous means that he used to create his army. Meanwhile, the opposing forces that serve under Kevin are mainly drones and robots, constructed around utensils and appliances typically found in a pizzeria, like ovens or pizza cutters. Also acting as the general of his side, Kevin fights in a large suit of mechanical armor with several pizza-themed weapons attached to it. He also utilizes more advanced battle tactics and techniques, including deploying his drones with more modern firearms. As the two warring factions battle for stuffed crust supremacy over Aglo, the SCP Foundation has established a safe zone around the area, 
evacuating any and all civilians from the area once they learned of the Doei disaster. Studying the ongoing battle, they have intercepted radio communiques between Mario and Kevin that shed light on their reasons for continuing their conflict for over 20 years. In one recording, Kevin lamented the fact that they'd been fighting so long and that there was no point in continuing, yet Mario refused to surrender. His rival argued that he couldn't let the newcomer win and take all of his customers, despite Kevin pointing out that their customers were dead, killed in the crossfire of the pizza war. The pair descended into an argument, with Mario calling Kevin out for hypnotizing the townsfolk into eating at the hot slice, and then forcing them to make his metallic army, while Kevin rebutted, citing how Mario murdered his earlier competitors through the use of black magic. Even with everyone in a 10-mile radius dead, Mario was still obsessed with defending his pizzeria. He accused Kevin of never having set foot in Pizza della Delicioso and that he was nothing more than a corporate shill with no care or pride in making cuisine for people. To this day, the pizza war is still ongoing and has been raging for much longer than the advertised 30 minutes or less. Working at the SCP Foundation can really get your appetite going. After spending a rough shift monitoring the acid levels in SCP-682's tank, or performing the rituals necessary to keep the Devourer of Worlds on the other side of SCP-2317, sometimes you just need a quick snack to hold you over before you return to the old grind. Problem is, at the SCP Foundation, even the break room can be perilous. Dr. Dan is notorious for pilfering pudding cups from the communal fridge, and ever since the administrator himself stole your tuna sandwich, you just don't feel safe spending your lunch break on site anymore. But this presents its own series of issues. You only have an hour for lunch, and obviously you can't order in due to security issues. Also, if you're eating off-site, you have even less time to finish your lunch because the site you're currently stationed at is relatively remote. We're talking at least a half-hour round trip to actually get to somewhere, so you're gonna need your food fast. And when it comes to fast food, few eateries are as prolific as the Golden Arches, McDonald's. And just to clarify, this video is not sponsored. We're gonna tell you about a horrifying anomalous secret that this company really doesn't want you to know about. Let's not think about that just yet, though. Your stomach is rumbling, and you need that quarter pounder so bad that even being trapped in the red reality with Dr. Scranton couldn't stop you from getting it. When you finally arrive, you buy your typical order. A quarter pounder with french fries, a coffee, and a McFlurry. You see Dr. Clef a few tables down enjoying a box of chicken nuggets and ketchup, but decide not to engage. As you sit and enjoy your meager little lunch, knowing you'll probably be coordinating the cleaning efforts of SCP-173's containment chamber by the end of the day, your eyes drift over to something even more unsettling. Happy, the current mascot for McDonald's Happy Meals. You can't help but shudder. You've seen some pretty horrific things on the job. Nightmarish things. You fear no monster, but that thing, it scares you. Those big, soulless eyes, the wide, gaping maw full of two white teeth. It's diabolical sneakers. No child should ever have to look at that. You can't help but wonder, whatever happened to Ronald McDonald, the hamburger happy clown that shilled fast food to you throughout your childhood? What is he up to now? Well, we have an answer for you, but I'll warn you, you may not be quite as eager to suck down a Big Mac and a Diet Coke after hearing this. Ronald McDonald, first introduced as the company's mascot in 1963, had a pretty good run before finally being largely phased out by the company in the mid-2010s for a greater focus on the nasty little box homunculus. You can thank John Wayne Gacy, Pennywise, and those goofballs dressed up as clowns back in 2016 for that. But like anyone who loses favor stateside, Ronald had a prosperous career ahead of him outside the country. Well, not the Ronald we know, at least. You see, in an undisclosed cattle farm in 2004, most likely in North America, a monster was born. A horrific abomination birthed from a cow, like many have theorized about SCP-058, the Heart of Darkness. But this nasty little creature wasn't a giant heart with a stinger and scorpion legs. In many ways, it appeared superficially humanoid, save for its stark white skin, its thick red lips, and its full head of bright, frizzy red hair. But that was only the start of the unnerving strangeness exhibited by this miracle child. It was born with white gloves, and long, clownish shoes seemingly grafted to its feet. 
Fresh from birth, the creature was huge, with a disproportionately large head and wide, disgusting pores that seemed to perpetually leak fry oil. The creature was unresponsive to any kind of external stimuli, perhaps suggesting it was brain dead, and it remained completely dormant most of the time. While most people would have screamed, run away, or called the police, the farmers at this particular cattle farm decided to let it ride and see how this whole nightmarish affair played out. That sense of curiosity and patience would soon pay off for them financially. It didn't take long for the creature to grow. The bigger it got, the more it looked like a giant mutant version of McDonald's iconic mascot, Ronald McDonald. And this wasn't just a coincidence, either. It turned out that this monster was somehow intrinsically linked to the McDonald's brand, because once a day, the creature would horrifically unhinge its jaw and begin to barf out a huge quantity of McDonald's food. And we're not talking about raw materials that are converted into McDonald's food. The creature, later dubbed SCP-5962, vomited out fully packaged McDonald's products. The owners of this clownish monster had just hit the lottery, so to speak. While the particulars of the deal are unclear, they somehow contacted a representative of the McDonald's Corporation based in China. In exchange for presumably a large sum of money, Chinese McDonald's operatives covertly entered the country and shepherded the now massive creature over to a McDonald's-owned warehouse in Beijing. By this point, it was around 4 meters tall and weighed over 5 tons. It was kept inside a cage and housed at some cost, but soon enough, the creature was paying for itself. As we mentioned before, the creature constantly secreted fry oil, which was siphoned off for use in preparing McDonald's food across the country. The huge quantity of packaged food that it vomited out every day was also shipped off to restaurants across the country, making the Chinese branch of McDonald's incredibly financially successful. They were able to make an almost complete profit on all of these foods and drinks, once transport costs were subtracted, of course. SCP-5962 had become McDonald's China's best-kept secret, but of course no secret this sensational could stay under wraps forever. No matter how much people in the warehouse were paid or threatened for their silence, if your day job was siphoning grease off of a giant mutant clown for the purpose of preparing McDonald's food across the country, there'd be no way you wouldn't speak to somebody about it. Nobody knows whose loose lips sunk this incredibly profitable ship, but rumors began to spread around Beijing about a huge clown inside of a McDonald's packaging facility. That was when local field agents of the SCP Foundation finally took notice. Two agents, Jonathan Zhang and George Nagasaw, were dispatched to perform an infiltration mission along with a team of backup personnel. They entered the warehouse, apprehending any employees they found. As they and their reinforcements reached the northern side of the facility, they found SCP-5962 with a heavy collar around its neck, chained to the ground like King Kong, as McDonald's employees wheeled away carts of packaged food. Neither of the attending agents were fans of McDonald's food, but even then, just seeing this horrible display was enough to make them feel nauseous. The creature was taken and contained by the SCP Foundation, who conducted a number of tests on it. They found that the monster had no real internal organs save for 27 interconnected stomachs, Genetically, they also found that the creature was far more cow than human. The same could sadly not be said for the food that SCP-5962 was vomiting out. Seriously, if you were already feeling a little queasy from all this, we need to warn you that this is the part where things get really vile. Let's talk about what the McDonald's food barfed up by SCP-5962 was actually made out of. As we mentioned earlier, the food exuded by the creature was genetically human, with DNA often matching that of people who are alive and in no way affected by this anomalous process. Tests have indicated that certain foods, condiments, and beverages correspond to more specific types of bodily tissue and liquid. For example, the bacon and fries were shown to be cartilage and ligaments. The bread turned out to be made from hair, nails, and skin. The coffee was liquefied fecal matter. The chicken nuggets were made from fingers, ovaries, and testes. Even the water was a mix of saline and sweat. And, of course, the ice cream was comprised of pus, bone marrow, feces, and nasal mucus, depending on the flavor. You get the idea. We'll stop listing off examples before you lose your lunch, but rest assured, all of the food produced by SCP-5962 was made of human organic matter. 
When the SCP Foundation interviewed Mr. Chen, the manager of the facility where SCP-5962 was being held, before his amnestic treatment he seemed incredibly casual about the whole thing. As far as he was concerned, the food still tasted exactly the same as regular McDonald's food, and it didn't appear to have any adverse health effects beyond what you could expect from regular non-anomalous fast food. It's actually less cruel and disturbing than the slaughterhouses where the meat is typically obtained. Mr. Chen also contested that SCP-5962 wasn't all that dangerous either. The only time it ever performed an offensive action was when an employee of the enemy fast food franchise, Burger King, entered its vicinity. The creature vomited a stream of hot coffee at the corporate interloper like a fire hose until he left, suggesting that it does have some kind of strange inherent loyalty to the McDonald's company. But still, other than this isolated incident, the creature has never even displayed sentience. It was a big, strange, clownish McDonald's food dispenser. When questioned about the origins of SCP-5962, Mr. Chen once again underplayed the strangeness of the situation, saying that he'd heard rumors the farm that sold him SCP-5962 had also sold other strange, anomalous creatures to eager buyers in the U.S. The farm, which we can only assume is situated right next to a radioactive waste dump, was also behind SCP-4158, also known as Big Charlie. This giant, omnivorous, and seemingly immortal mutant cow is believed to have been birthed from a non-anomalous cow sold to the Butcher's Block Slaughterhouse. It looked hideous and seemed to suffer from a wide variety of health issues, leading to the employees at the slaughterhouse trying to put the creature out of its misery. However, no matter how hard they tried to kill the monster, it just wouldn't die. Its bones were pretty much indestructible, and no matter how much of its flesh was cut off, it just kept growing back, causing no ill effects to the creature itself. Eventually, the slaughterhouse workers tried cooking and eating the meat, leading to them discovering it tasted just as good as non-anomalous meat. Much like the Chinese McDonald's and SCP-5962, the workers had just hit the lottery with Big Charlie. As long as they kept feeding the monster, which ate everything from bricks to other non-anomalous cows, it provided a pretty much limitless supply of meat, giving them unprecedented economic prosperity. In other words, Big Charlie was a literal cash cow. Jeff Fine, the slaughterhouse director, even started worshipping Big Charlie as a kind of demigod by drinking his blood. He believed that Big Charlie was a savior, sent to lift them all out of their struggle and desperation. Sadly for them, the SCP Foundation sent them right back when Big Charlie escaped their slaughterhouse, and Foundation field agents found, secured, and contained it. It was a sad day for the butcher's block. So, what have we learned today? Whether you're in the US of A or the Chinese heartland, if you're chowing down on fast food, you really have no idea where it came from. I mean, we kind of knew that already, but for all we know, the food you're enjoying could have just been vomited up by a giant fat clown, or cut from the flesh of a mutated cow. Just think about that next time you're enjoying a burger. But hey, let's be honest with ourselves. We'll all probably still eat it. Feeling hungry? Maybe you could go for a snack right about now or a nice refreshing can of your favorite soda. Perhaps if you've got some change burning a hole in your pocket, a nearby vending machine would be a good choice. And trust us, there's no vending machine like this one. SCP-261 will give you a treat that's out of this world, or rather, out of this dimension. That's how this safe class anomaly earned its incredibly accurate name, the Interdimensional Vending Machine. It was first discovered in a dark alley in Yokohama, Japan. Japan is a place where you can find a number of strange and surprising things in vending machines, but nothing quite like this. The Foundation was first alerted to its presence after one of their web trawlers noticed some interesting chatter on Japanese online message boards about a magic vending machine. To these Japanese forum users, it sounded like a fanciful urban legend, a vending machine where you could get something truly fantastical if you have the yen to spare. But upon thorough investigation, field agents of the SCP Foundation discovered that the machine was no legend and brought it into containment. It's the kind of thing you wouldn't look twice at. An utterly generic black vending machine with no viewing window and a handwritten sign in Japanese that reads, Out of Order. But what the vending machine looks like isn't nearly as interesting as what it's capable of. When you insert your money into the machine, and it's important to note that it only accepts Japanese yen, the machine will dispense some kind of snack food or drink item. However, over time, the more the machine is used in a single day, 
the more bizarre the items it spits out will become. Foundation researchers have attempted to figure out how the machine works, but their task has been incredibly difficult so far. It doesn't appear to contain any snacks, and it doesn't seem to be made of any anomalous parts. Moreover, the machine simply won't work when the front panel is opened, or when any surveillance equipment is placed inside. In other words, it's pretty much impossible to look this gift horse in the mouth. Strangely, the machine is also capable of working without power, though when unpowered the vended products are likely to become stranger much faster. But let's be honest here, you're not here for Vending Machine Mechanics 101. You want to hear about all the weird stuff that SCP-261 dispenses, and frankly, we're with you on that one. Lucky for all of us, this is one of the anomalies that the Foundation has truly extensive test records on, providing us with a highlight reel of some of the strangest, wildest, and downright most interesting snacks and drinks straight out of another dimension. Bon Appetit! Let's start off nice and easy with some of the snacks and drinks that are not only edible but also sound like they'd actually be pretty tasty. Like Pepsi Dragon Twist, a bottle of Pepsi soda with English packaging that tastes like dragon fruit. PepsiCo does not produce such a product, but honestly we wish they did. Same for Dark Side Cola, a clear liquid that becomes jet black shortly after being opened, which apparently tastes like your average can of Coke with a touch of spice thrown in. But hey, not everybody likes cola. Maybe you're a maverick, a rebel. Only a soft drink with a formal title can quench your thirst, and as such, you prefer Dr. Pepper. In which case, maybe the vending machine will furnish you with an interdimensional Japanese product known as Dr. Pepper's Amusing Straw. This spatial anomaly wrapped inside a whimsical Dr. Pepper branded straw seems to contain far more liquid than should be able to fit in the straw, about one bottle's worth of soda to be precise. A nice and convenient solution for whenever you need to get the fix that only an accredited doctor of popology can provide. And if you fancy something from the more intoxicating end of the beverage spectrum, for 600 yen you can get yourself a rare bottle of Billy Beer. It's just the thing for those who weren't alive during the Carter administration, but still want to try brew that was endorsed by the younger brother of President Jimmy Carter. This anomalous bottle of suds, which was bottled in the 1970s according to its label, came with a note reading, I had this beer brewed just for me. I think it's the best I've ever tasted, and I've tasted a lot. I think you'd like it too. Billy Carter. Drinking the beer got a D-class intoxicated for 72 hours. But what if you've just wet your whistle and worked up a hunger in the process? Thankfully, SCP-261 has some delicious interdimensional food to satisfy your cravings. So for starters, how about a tube of the Little Bakery 7 Grain? This small aluminum tube lets you squeeze out a blob of dough, which instantly rises and cooks itself into a tasty little loaf of bread. Testing has indicated that the bread is a little chewy, but still tastes completely fine. Not bad for a tube to bake good. How about some seafood to go with that bread? Then maybe for your entree, you can crack open a delicious pack of lemon clams. And we do mean crack very literally here. If you crack this bag of anomalous clams like a glow stick, they boil themselves. And once you open them, you're ready to enjoy a serving of tasty clams that have a slight lemon flavoring to them. Delicious. But if you're not that hungry and just feeling more like a snack than a full fancy dinner, the machine once put out the Lay's Bloomin' Onion. While it appears to be a normal onion, each layer of the onion is a different flavor of chip, leading all the way into the middle. Truly a gourmet snack with more layers than, well, actually exactly as many layers as an onion. And what about for those who are anomalously trapped in the year 2012 and are looking for a snack that is both tasty and meme-worthy? Well, you'd be lucky to receive a 700 yen bacon shirt. It's exactly what it says on the can, an edible shirt that both smells and tastes like bacon, and has no real side effects other than making you smell a little like bacon while you're wearing it. Though this could be a dangerous anomalous effect if you decide to walk through your local dog park while you're wearing it. We've been told it pairs well with the meat hat, teriyaki fedora, a size 64 trilby style fedora made entirely out of teriyaki flavored beef jerky. The object came flattened in a cardboard box bearing the tagline, you can have your hat and eat it too, which is a pun that probably makes a lot more sense in their dimension. Still a bit hungry? Well, lucky for you, this magical vending machine has got you covered on dessert too. For 700 yen, the foundation was given an entire edible chess set, 
with each of the ornate pieces carved from what seemed like hard Pez-style candy. It's less checkmate and more check eight. Another pun that I promise is funnier in another dimension. And for 300 yen extra, you might walk away with a candy robot playset. These are more hard candy components that can be put together to create functional, anomalous mini robots that move on their own, walking aimlessly and bumping into walls. But what about the full meal craving consumer on the go? Who wants both a dinner and a dessert combined into one disgusting package? Don't worry, the interdimensional vending machine has got you covered. Just 400 yen can net you some delicious turdako chakan. These are balls of fried turkey filled with chocolate, a smaller ball of duck, more chocolate, and in the very center, a small ball of fried chicken. Even the labeling on the product describes it as having 450% of an adult human's daily recommended fat intake. We'll leave it to you to decide if this is a decadent treat worthy of the gods or utterly disgusting. Maybe you're feeling a little cheeky, though, or you need the perfect comedic dessert for your bachelorette party. The vending machine has a candy direct from an alternate Korea, a tasty, if slightly too sweet, chocolate candy shaped like a certain male organ, filled with, we kid you not, liquid white chocolate. Perfect for anyone who has both the sweet tooth and the sense of humor of a 12-year-old. Okay, these were definitely all weird treats, but let's get really, really strange now. From the disgusting, to the confusing, to the inedible, to the straight-up deadly. If you're a bit of a sadist, perhaps you're the kind of person who enjoys watching their snacks dying in front of them before they eat them. For that, the vending machine provides an aluminum box with a viewing window and a red button on top. Inside are a collection of small furry creatures, each with a single big eye. When the button is pressed, the creatures inside are abruptly superheated, cooking them all to death. At that point, the box opens, and the creatures are ready to eat. We've been told they were crunchy, spicy, and tasted a little like beef. Maybe you're part of the slow food movement. For that, we recommend the delicious pile of slugs, which is exactly what it sounds like. This is a produce box, like the kind used for packing strawberries, except it's full of live slugs. There are both advantages and disadvantages to actually eating these slugs. The advantage is that they contain large amounts of vitamin C, E, and most of the B complex, which are all crucial to a healthy and balanced diet. The disadvantage is that they contain large amounts of arsenic, which will kill you. Though, of course, if you still have a candy-flavored death wish, but you prefer your entomological treats a little more leggy, then may we interest you in a fine caramelized spider for a modest 500 yen. It's full of deadly quantities of an unknown anomalous venom that's pretty much impossible to cure, but it's worth it for the sweet, sticky goodness that comes before death sets in. Another strange item dispensed by the vending machine was a tall metal aluminum canister with a ring pull that, upon opening, had a violent chemical reaction with the air and triggered a large explosion. Apparently, this particular beverage was never intended for oxygenated environments. The blast killed two researchers and resulted in the temporary suspension of testing. Though in a slight silver lining for this fiasco, the testing area did smell of citrus for a few days, which the janitors must have enjoyed as they cleaned up all the body parts. Another dangerous snack provided by the vending machine was a long tube of chips called Prangles, not to be confused with any other long, tube-based chips you may be thinking of. When the tube was opened, or popped, as they say, the D-class that the chips were presented to began compulsively eating them. When researchers ordered the D-Class to stop, it seemed almost as if they couldn't. Regardless of the orders given to them, the D-Class just kept eating. Even when guards terminated the D-Class there and then, the corpse continued to eat chips out of the tube until it was physically pried out of their hands. But if all those salty prangles had really worked up a thirst in you, perhaps you can wash them down with a delicious can of cherry bomb. An intense cherry-flavored drink dispensed by SCP-261 for 450 yen. When a D-Class sampled this delicious soda, they commented on it tasting strongly of cherry. A few moments later, their head exploded with the force of a stick of dynamite, coating everyone and everything around it in gooey head viscera. The resulting cleanup took an arduous six hours, but wow, was that cherry tasty. And finally, why not complete this anomalous vending machine feast with a 1,000 yen paper mache piñata? 
resembling a dead horse that comes ready to use with a baseball bat. Everyone who saw the piñata fell compelled to beat it mercilessly with the bat, until candy began to fall out. Many in attendance claim that it was the 1,000th gift unleashed by SCP-261, and thus warranted celebration. Once the dead horse was thoroughly beaten, all cognitohazardous properties ceased. There's a joke somewhere in there, but for the life of us, we're not sure we can find it. Oh well, maybe it's in another dimension. Think back to your childhood and ask yourself, what was the most pain you've ever felt while growing up? As we develop, our understanding of pain evolves according to our different experiences. The older we get, the injuries we suffered as children like a scraped knee or a bee sting rarely cause us the same level of distress as they used to. Of course, when you are young and unfamiliar with sensations of pain, what you really need in that moment straight after you've fallen off your bike or tripped playing soccer is someone to pick you back up and give your sore spot a kiss. Perhaps you even need a bowl of warm soup to comfort you. Luckily for you, SCP-348 is exactly that. While many of the anomalies held in containment by the SCP Foundation have earned the Euclid or infamous Keter class designations, SCP-348 is one of the few considered to be safe, both in the sense it poses no containment risk and in that it wouldn't hurt a fly. It is neither an ancient eldritch abomination from another dimension spreading its influence in our world through mimetic stimuli, nor is it a recording of a basketball game in which all the players and spectators are trapped inside. It isn't an indestructible limb-generating reptile or a towering winged being wielding a flaming sword and guarding the entrance to the Garden of Eden. To put it simply, SCP-348 is a bull a white ceramic bowl, the kind you would find almost anywhere in the world. It may even look indistinguishable from the one in your kitchen cabinet. Of course, SCP-348 is hardly as ordinary as it outwardly appears to be, and it certainly isn't the only inanimate object that the Foundation keeps safely stored away. The key thing that differentiates SCP-348 from most other anomalies is how genuinely harmless it is. Its anomalous properties do not cause injury to any individual that interacts with it, nor does this bowl have any adverse effects on the world around it. SCP-348 cannot bend or reshape reality. It does not cause the person eating from it to have premonitions of their own death, and using it certainly does not manifest a contract-making entity at the opposite side of the table. So what makes this bowl in any way anomalous? What about it categorizes it as an SCP and not just a harmless piece of fine crockery? Well, why don't we start with how SCP-348 was first discovered? Some time ago, the SCP Foundation was made aware of rumors surrounding a child living in an unknown part of the world. According to the intelligence gathered by the Foundation, this child seemed to possess some sort of healing ability. Or at least, this is what rumors suggested. Upon further investigation, the source of these so-called remarkable recovery abilities wasn't the child, but appeared to come from a small ceramic bowl, which we now know as SCP-348. This is not to say that the bowl has any inherently supernatural healing properties, and it doesn't impart any regenerative power to those that eat from it either. It does heal in a certain sense, but not in the way you're probably imagining. When the SCP Foundation recovered SCP-348, there were no markings on it indicating where the bowl came from or who it was manufactured by. The only visually distinct details worthy of note were flowery patterns that appeared to be hand-painted around both the inside and outside of SCP-348. The ceramic surface also bore the Chinese letters Shang Xinyi, which translates to the phrase, thinking of you. The child that first discovered it found the ceramic bowl in the attic of their home. The child's parents were both full-time workers and seemed to be somewhat neglectful of their child, although they refused to comment on this. But according to the findings of the SCP Foundation, the child had come to rely on SCP-348. Deciding to further investigate the anomalous properties of SCP-348, the Foundation began testing it. Given that the child who first discovered the bowl had relied upon it, Tests involve Foundation researchers presenting certain children to SCP-348 and observing the results. So was this bowl haunted? Perhaps harboring some malicious spirit or entity that sought to corrupt these children, maybe even healing them in order to somehow use them as a vessel to break into our world? No. And while it may have not healed in any overt or expected way, it did heal in at least a metaphorical sense. 
If presented with an injured child sporting any form of minor ailment such as a cut or a runny nose, SCP-348 fills with warm soup. And yes, that's right, we said soup. What kind, you may ask? Well, that seems to vary. Sometimes it is tomato soup, other times it might be chicken noodle soup. While the ingredients used in the soups are often different, there are notable consistencies to how SCP-348 heals. If anyone between the ages of 4 years old and 18 years old sits down in front of the blue flowered bowl, then SCP-348 will fill with soup. Numerous young test subjects brought in by the Foundation to eat from this particular bowl of soup have reported that they enjoyed their meal, usually finishing the entire bowl when permitted to by research staff. Many of the injured children that were tested have stated that the soup they eat from SCP-348 reminds them of their parents' cooking. These children have expressed contentment and feelings of comfort after acquiring their various cuts and bruises. Some even claim that even though they were in a room all alone, they didn't feel lonely when they were eating the soup. And all the anomalous properties don't end after a child finishes the soup. Usually, although not always, the bowl will leave the child a message, often some brief words of reassurance or comfort. These messages materialize on the inside rim of the bowl and seem to be specifically tailored to the subject that has just eaten. The words will not only be written in the child's first language, but are often linked to the child's home life or relationship with their parents. Messages that appear on SCP-348 usually fade over time, normally disappearing after a few hours or when the bowl refills with more soup. One test of SCP-348 saw a little girl, age 8 and suffering from a sore throat, brought before the bowl. According to a background screening made by research personnel, the girl lived with her biological parents and apparently had a good relationship with both her mother and her father. When SCP-348 filled with soup for her, the girl took almost half an hour to finish eating and afterwards reported that she felt her sore throat get better as she ate. By the end of the meal, this test subject remarked that she felt completely normal. In this instance, no message appeared within the bowl. Another child was brought in to continue the testing of SCP-348, this time a boy of 10. Unlike the previous test, this boy was not on good terms with his parents and often argued with them. At the time of testing, the boy had sustained several minor bruises, the result of a small accident that occurred while the boy had been out riding his bike. Much like the little girl, this subject ate the soup that SCP-348 presented him with. This time though, the bowl offered a message to the boy. The lettering found on the ceramic surface of SCP-348 simply read, Don't forget to brush. Messages also appeared when an 11-year-old boy with a slight cold ate soup from the bowl. This child had been adopted by a foster family, and after eating from SCP-348, he saw the message, I'm glad you're happy, appear. Another young test subject, a boy age 6, had a similar experience. In this instance, the child had several scrapes and scratches from playing with his friends. His parents had divorced, and he was living with his mother at the time of testing. This time, SCP-348's message to this boy read, I'm sorry, son. A seven-year-old girl suffering from a cough was brought in before SCP-348. She had lost her father to a traffic accident some time before testing commenced and received the message, I love you, after finishing her soup. Further testing conducted by the Foundation revealed that anyone over the age of 18 years who attempted to eat soup from SCP-348 experienced things slightly differently. Unlike the children, older subjects mostly displayed a disinterest in finishing their meal. A common complaint among those over 18 was that the soup was missing something. However, in a few isolated cases, testing SCP-348 on older candidates still revealed messages, although the words seemed to be faded, not the clear hand-painted blue that appeared when the children had finished their soup. One woman aged 30 who was suffering from a headache sat down in front of SCP-348. Much like it had done before, the bowl filled with soup and the woman ate. As with some of the younger subjects, a key aspect of this woman's background seemed to be what triggered the message to appear. Specifically, she admitted to being on bad terms with her mother and father. The woman explained that she had opted to live on her own, isolating herself from her family. In fact, she even described having rejected an offer her father made to her many years earlier, refusing some career training that he was willing to give in order to help her secure a job. When she finished the soup, one word appeared in the bowl. Why? 
Another woman who was 40 years old was also brought in for the SCP-348 testing. Much like the previous subject, she had moved away from home and became estranged from her parents over the years. But unlike the previous test, this woman had taken it upon herself to not only send money to her parents, but also arrange senior care for both as well. Prior to testing, her father had died peacefully of natural causes after spending his last days in the care that this woman had paid for. As the woman ate the soup from the bowl, she remarked about its apparently bitter taste, but also described her meal as fulfilling. After she had finished, the words thank you appeared within SCP-348. One other adult subject that produced a noticeable result from SCP-348 was a 40-year-old male. The results of this test appeared to be the most distinctly different from any previous adult or child. By now, researchers working for the SCP Foundation had determined that familial history seemed to play an important role in the outcome of any interaction with SCP-348, and this individual was certainly different to most. The man in question had murdered his father roughly a year before the testing took place. He began the test with SCP-348 while afflicted with aches in his back. After one taste of the soup that appeared in the bowl before him, the murderer was immediately repulsed. He complained about the taste, refusing to eat any more from SCP-348. Shortly after, the man began to experience severe stomach pain. The potentially poisonous soup was disposed of, but SCP-348 immediately filled with salt water, which took three hours to disappear from the bowl. Despite conducting numerous tests with subjects of all ages and ailments, the SCP Foundation researchers have so far been unable to determine the origins of the messages that sometimes appear in SCP-348. Some have theorized because of the family histories of some children and adults tested that the words somehow come from the father of whoever eats the soup. Since even when a subject's father is alive or present in their life, the message seems to convey feelings that their father has or would have. Other researchers claim that this is just the purpose of SCP-348, to provide comfort to small children dealing with pain, both inside and out. After all, isn't providing comfort what a good bowl of soup, anomalous or not, is best at? For a moment, we want you to cast your mind back to your childhood, a time when you weren't as busy or burdened with the pressures of life that come as you grow up. When you were carefree and had your whole life ahead of you, nothing but potential and opportunity. A simpler time, when the highest award you could achieve wasn't a grade or a promotion, but something as simple as your mom or dad pinning a drawing you did to the door of the refrigerator. Oh, to be a kid again, right? Then again, maybe returning to younger days is better left as a fantasy. It's hard to imagine that something so pure, so simple and wholesome as a drawing on the fridge could ever be something dark, horrific even. But then you learn about SCP-683, and all of a sudden returning to your childhood becomes something you hope never happens. SCP-683 is an anomaly with various parts to it, so we'll start with SCP-683-1. At first glance, it looks to be just an ordinary refrigerator. To be more precise, it's actually a 1953 Crosley Shelvador. For any of you fridge experts out there who are curious about the exact make and model of SCP-683-1. For everyone else, picture the refrigerator that Indiana Jones hid inside to miraculously survive a nuclear blast in Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. That was such a plot device. I don't know about you guys, but I'm feeling nervous already. Like we said, at first glance you'd struggle to spot anything out of the ordinary about this particular fridge, apart from maybe some slight wear and tear on the outside. Inside though, it's perfectly clean, kept in perfect working condition for keeping food cool. But that's the first weird thing about SCP-683-1. You see, despite the Foundation conducting tests to deliberately make it messier, the fridge seems to have an inbuilt function that you wouldn't find in one from Home Depot. It can self-clean. Yes, that doesn't sound all that impressive, unless you're a fridge owner yourself and know what a nightmare they can be to keep clean. While it's definitely weird, it's not the last of SCP-683-1's anomalous properties. The next is the fact that the power cord of this refrigerator ends with a plug that doesn't match any known type of wall outlet. Seems even stranger. After all, who would design a fridge that can't even be plugged in, right? 
In fact, the SCP Foundation had to design their very own completely one-of-a-kind adapter to connect SCP-683-1 to an ordinary gas-powered home generator. Once plugged in, though, SCP-683-1 functions exactly like you would expect any other refrigerator to. Mm, sort of. It's about time we move on to SCP-683's second component, designated as SCP-683-2. Again, much like the fridge it is somehow affixed to, at first look this part looks completely ordinary. It's a drawing, created using felt pens and pencils, presumably by a child between the ages of 5 and 7 years old. There's evidence of some moderate water damage to the paper, but once again nothing all that strange to look at. Even the subject of this child's drawing is pretty mundane, just some scribbles of a pleasant mountainous landscape. A house, a well, a dog, a figure wearing a chef's took, and, of course, an anthropomorphic sun with a smiley face. Now sure, that might not sound all that impressive, but we would advise you not to say anything like that out loud. Criticizing the drawing is a comment you might wish you hadn't made. Just like when you fill our comment sections with dated Among Us memes. Seriously, it's getting old. Any person that makes any kind of negative or disparaging remark about the SCP-683-2 drawing or tries to remove the paper from the fridge door of SCP-683-1 will suffer a grim, horrific fate. The next time they try to eat anything, this person will suffer immense, irreparable damage to their internal organs, along with their skin and muscle tissue. This is intensely painful causing the subject agonizing pain as their organs and skin are melted down. The amount the person loses is equal to the mass of food they've eaten. With each bite, they will lose more and more of their body. The painful process will not stop until they have ingested 0.42 kilograms of food, making this even worse. The process doesn't seem to target any organs that would kill the subject immediately. They're made to suffer in excruciating pain, punished with torture for daring to try and remove the drawing from the fridge. Any and all subjects will die within 26 days of taking that final bite and thus losing the last piece of themselves. But where do the body parts of these people go? Surely they don't disappear, you must be thinking. And you would be right. In instances like this, the third mystery component of SCP-683 is revealed. Referred to as SCP-683-3, a brown paper lunch bag will manifest inside the SCP-683-1 fridge, containing a grim and grisly assortment of meals. On every occasion, the bag contains a sandwich with a pretty disgusting filling. The flesh and viscera of the last person who dared to criticize the drawing on the refrigerator. There is also a plastic Ziploc bag, in which you'll find the other half of the stolen organs and flesh of this unlucky person, along with three chocolate chip cookies. Surprisingly, these are actually completely normal cookies, with no traces of DNA or other abnormalities to them. Every time, there is also one final item that forms the contents of SCP-683-3, and that's a note, which reads, Be a good boy today. This note bears the same handwriting as appears on the outer surface of the paper bag, upon which a single name is written, Eric. Now, for those of you in the know about the various anomalies of the SCP Foundation, that particular unassuming name might sound very familiar. It was the same name mentioned by another anomaly, known as SCP-066. A brief bit of context for you, SCP-066 was a living ball of yarn that displayed friendly behavior towards Foundation staff. However, during an experiment, a thread was cut from SCP-066's body. This caused the yarn to transform into a ball of meat, with a pair of functional eyes protruding from it. SCP-066 became hostile, constantly asking for an Eric whenever someone gets too close to it. The same name, Eric, was also found carved into the back of SCP-168, another anomaly encountered by the SCP Foundation. SCP-168 was an anomalous calculator, which actually possessed some level of sentience and had the ability to communicate. So who is Eric? Well, theories range far and wide, but there's no real definitive answer as to exactly who or what Eric might be. Some claim he's a reality-bending entity, Others posit he's an SCP that the Foundation just doesn't know about yet. 
Regardless, he's connected to some intriguing entities. A sentient calculator, a formerly friendly ball of yarn, and a fridge with a child's drawing on it that can steal people's organs and put them in a lunch bag, especially for him. It would seem that Eric is a child, maybe a schoolboy, possibly even the one responsible for the drawing on SCP-683. This child could even potentially be anomalous in nature. Of course, this is all just rampant speculation on our part, so it's probably best to take all of that with a grain of salt. As we've said before, it is just a theory, an SCP explained theory. Eric might just remain one of the Foundation's many unanswered mysteries for years to come. But if that answer doesn't satisfy you, then why don't we go back to SCP-683? Maybe something in the fridge's origin will give us a further clue to the mystery of who Eric is. The fridge was first discovered by the SCP Foundation in the storage unit of a Washington home owned by a woman named Yolanda. As coincidence would have it, Yolanda was a collector of vintage home furnishings, including refrigerators, which would probably explain why she didn't think to throw out such an old model of fridge from the 1950s. According to her, she found SCP-683 simply left on a nearby street corner, with nobody around that could have left it there, or anyone that could have possibly been transporting it to the local dump. To give her a hand moving the fridge, Yolanda enlisted the help of her nephew, who agreed to step in and assist her in getting SCP-683 back to her house. Unfortunately though, the nephew passed away only two weeks later, apparently due to medical complications that came as the result of a hernia, according to his death certificate. Could Yolanda's nephew have been the mysterious and elusive Eric? Could something have happened to him after his death that allowed him to become some kind of anomaly? Who's to say? We can only guess and hope that one day we might get a full answer. As to why Yolanda never suffered the effects of SCP-683, she never actually tried to take the SCP-683-2 drawing down from the fridge. When asked why, she simply replied, It's a nice little picture, isn't it? Why take it down? Maybe, just maybe, it might have even reminded her of her nephew. It would have been a futile and foolish idea for Yolanda to have even tried to remove the drawing at any rate, as any who try will suffer that painful and horrifying process of losing their organs and having them appear in Eric's paper lunch bag. Even fire can't remove the drawing from the fridge, at least not permanently, suggesting that even the paper it is drawn on has its own anomalous properties. On three separate occasions, the SCP Foundation has attempted to test this, setting SCP-683-2 on fire with nothing more than a match. Every time, the drawing was incinerated, burning to ashes until there was nothing left. But within 68 hours, SCP-683-2 had returned to its permanent fixture on the fridge door, as if nothing had happened. Interestingly though, the D-Class members of personnel that were instructed to burn the drawing didn't suffer the usual anomalous effects of SCP-683. A similar thing happens if multiple people attempt to remove SCP-683-2 or say anything negative towards the drawing. In cases like this, only the very first person who made a disparaging remark or trying to rip the drawing from the fridge will be the one to suffer a long, painful torture by organ removal, followed swiftly by death. Now if you cast your mind back to earlier in the video, we told you that someone who tries removing or disparages SCP-683-2 will only suffer an anomalous lack of organs when they next eat something. So you must be thinking that the way to avoid that is to simply not eat, to fast, and not ingest a single meal. And yes, you'd be right. That does stave off the anomalous effects of the fridge and the drawing, but also means you're heading towards an even slower, painful death from starvation. To date, two different Foundation test subjects have died this way by refusing to eat after interacting with SCP-683. True, the SCP Foundation is most likely sitting on a whole cavalcade of different anomalies that can keep a person alive without the need for food, but you know what they're like, right? The Foundation's hardly likely to share the keys to surviving without having to eat. And there you have it, folks. That's SCP-683. Don't worry, it's highly unlikely that you'll ever encounter it. The Foundation keeps it under lock and key, in a cell fitted with a steel door and reinforced hinges. 
SCP-683 remains covered in a large cloth to prevent any members of personnel from looking at it when the fridge isn't being used for research or experiments. But you have to wonder, what if it's not the only fridge with these anomalous properties? After all, it's rare for a manufacturer to make just a single refrigerator of a certain model. Maybe you'd better be wary next time you visit someone with an older model of fridge in their kitchen. And just to be safe, if there is a drawing pin to the front door, leave it where it is. An SCP Foundation researcher sits at a table inside of a standard containment cell. These are often dangerous places to be, especially when the SCP you're supposed to be studying is one that you can't see. The researcher is taking notes, unsure of exactly what is going to happen next. He can hear the sounds of knives scraping behind, of flesh sizzling and searing from high heat. He braces himself as a burst of heat hits the back of his head, as if a fireball has erupted. An object floats through the air and settles in front of him on the table. It's a plate of food, and it looks delicious. It may surprise you to learn that there is no rule that the SCP Foundation must deal exclusively with violent and vicious creatures. Not every SCP held in containment shares the same malevolence and contempt for humanity as SCP-682, or the world-ending threat posed by the likes of SCP-2317. Some, perhaps not many, but some, are benign and might even seem outwardly friendly but you'd still be taking a huge risk to assume that anything contained by the SCP Foundation is completely harmless. Such is the case with SCP-5031. As per the Foundation's containment procedures, this quasi-humanoid, meaning it appears to have some vaguely human features, is held in an airtight cell that is regularly checked by Foundation personnel on a bi-weekly basis. SCP-5031 has no need for regular nutrition or regular interactions from staff. The trick with SCP-5031 is not being eaten by it, since though it doesn't need food, it does still hunt and consume anything it encounters, human or otherwise. Avoiding being eaten is hard enough with creatures that can actually be seen, but like so many other creatures the Foundation keeps contained, SCP-5031 has developed an almost perfect defense mechanism, which is when observed, it will literally cease to exist. Some might choose to refer to this as a quantum lock, however it is worth noting that traces left by SCP-5031 still remain observable when the creature has temporarily disappeared. For example, trails of blood and scratch marks left behind by SCP-5031 still exist when the SCP itself does not. Naturally, this makes both avoiding the creature and capturing it using cameras difficult. However, when SCP-5031's existence ceases, it still casts a shadow. From this, researchers have been able to determine several of the creature's physical traits. Based on its silhouette, it has been deduced that SCP-5031 levitates about half a meter above ground level, sports an abnormally small necklace head atop an elongated torso, approximately 1.9 meters long, with three sets of spindly lower arms that branch outwards. Using these arms and its loosely hanging body, SCP-5031 will lower itself to hunt any human or animal that draws near to it, and uses the blade-like tail to cut up food. Perhaps the most interesting facet of SCP-5031 beyond its defensive capabilities and apparent physical attributes are the series of nine tests conducted by senior researcher Stanley Huxtable. Appalled by the conditions that the creature was being kept in, Huxtable took over the role of HCL supervisor for SCP-5031. Having grown increasingly frustrated and empathetic towards the creature, listening to its screams from inside its iron containment unit, Huxtable devised a series of tests to introduce SCP-5031 to various different stimuli as a way to better understand the creature, and hopefully keep it contained in a way that didn't seem to cause so much suffering. It's worth remembering that the SCP Foundation makes its mission to be cold, not cruel, in performing their duties to protect normality, and many of the researchers and staff are just as capable of having empathy for creatures as you might for a stray animal at a shelter. The first of Huxtable's tests involved installing speakers in SCP-5031 cell, through which a variety of different ambient and popular pieces of music were played to see if they had any effect on reducing the creature's stress. 
by judging SCP-5031 stress levels based on how much it screamed when compared to normal. Huxtable was able to determine how to best use music to calm the creature. SCP-5031 seemed to convey higher levels of stress when listening to Morning Forest, Deep Grotto, and Seaside Paradise Ambience, as well as the best of late 60s British rock band Jethro Tull. However, the best of Mozart, Enya, Kiss, and Ben Folds produced dramatically different results, decreasing SCP-5031's apparent stress. Following this test, senior researcher Huxtable compiled a playlist featuring SCP-5031's favorite music. Over time, the stress-reducing effects of music on SCP-5031 seemed to decrease, but keeping the playlist on shuffle seemed to keep the creature consistently calmer than it had been previously. The next test involved introducing inanimate objects into SCP-5031's enclosure to monitor its reactions and how its stress levels were affected. When a softball was thrown into the enclosure, SCP-5031 immediately sliced the ball in two with its tail in one swift motion. A similar result occurred when researchers threw the creature a basketball, which was quickly punctured and sliced open by SCP-5031's tail. Its stress levels first seemed to diminish when the creature was offered a bowling ball, which it rolled around the enclosure and then later knocked it against a second bowling ball. However, when one of the balls chipped, rendering it unable to roll properly, SCP-5031 stress increased dramatically until a replacement was offered. Researcher Huxtable noted that SCP-5031 seemed to possess a similar level of motor skills to an average human toddler, with similarly explosive emotional reactions to match. <laughs> Next, when given the choice between two food sources at opposite ends of its enclosure, SCP-5031 seemed to gravitate towards higher quality food, most notably favored cooked rotisserie chickens over animal carcasses. It even chose this option over a live chicken, using its tail to cut its food into more manageable bite-sized portions, rather than ripping its meat with its hands or teeth like many of its fellow SCPs. Researcher Huxtable recorded these findings and highlighted that, even though SCP-5031 didn't need to eat in order to survive, providing the creature with food of a better quality marginally reduced its stress. Senior researcher Huxtable next attempted to test SCP-5031's coexistence with other living subjects, each time making sure that the creature had been adequately fed to avoid any unseemly incidents. First, a live chicken was introduced. SCP-5031 rolled its bowling ball at high speed towards the chicken, increasing both its and the chicken's stress levels and inadvertently killing the chicken in the process. When a second chicken was introduced, SCP-5031 gently rolled a basketball towards it, but ceased any further engagement after the chicken squawked from being hit by the ball. Next to be introduced into the enclosure was a blindfolded D-class staff member who was instructed to sit down and roll the basketball towards SCP-5031. After doing so for several minutes, the creature began to approach the D-class subject, who was instructed to remove their blindfold to cease the creature's existence and prevent any potentially deadly incidents. Finally, researcher Huxtable had another Class D engage in a game of catch with SCP-5031 while facing away from the creature. This test proceeded successfully, and senior researcher Huxtable remarked how SCP-5031's motor skills were improving, albeit gradually and with some gentle encouragement. Through Huxtable's tests, the creature was learning. The next test, focused on teaching SCP-5031 linguistic symbols, utilized LCD displays and buttons connected to a food dispenser. One display showed an image of a rock, and the other an image of a rotisserie chicken. After some brief probing, SCP-5031 was quickly able to understand that pressing the button under the correct display would dispense a rotisserie chicken for it to eat. The creature was later able to adapt when, the following day, the screen displays and materials dispensed were swapped, and then later set to swap at random intervals. When additional rock dispensing stations were introduced, this time displaying the word rock as opposed to an image, SCP-5031 was able to determine which station dispensed chicken through a process of elimination. Whenever the functions and displays were swapped, SCP-5031 would find whichever displayed the word chicken to receive its food. The final phase of this test presented SCP-5031 with a single station, displaying the word chicken, but with a button that would remain inactive unless the creature spelled out the same word with a collection of lettered blocks it was provided with. 
After some initial confusion and frustrations as to why the button would not dispense food when pressed, SCP-5031 was able to assemble the word correctly, not only activating the button and dispensing food, but proving to researcher Huxtable that the creature was capable of learning language. Huxtable continued to test the creature, encouraging it to spell words using lettered blocks as a method of communicating. By increasing SCP-5031's vocabulary and the amount of human interaction it received, senior researcher Huxtable observed that SCP-5031 was gradually learning to sing, albeit non-verbally, as well as to juggle with its six hands and was even communicating its food preferences and dish pairings. Later, another Class D, D-52125, was introduced to SCP-5031's enclosure to aid in further testing. Through D-52125's instructions, the creature quickly learned to draw using crayons and created artworks depicting itself. Its newfound friend D-52125, researcher Huxtable, a cat, and a rotisserie chicken. SCP-5031's new creative side didn't stop there, though as the creature quickly learned to play chopsticks in only two days once a piano was introduced into the enclosure. SCP-5031 even managed to start creating its own original, admittedly crude, compositions. Next, a spice rack was placed inside the creature's cell, and D-52125 demonstrated how to season meat. This proved to be SCP-5031's new favorite hobby, as it spent the next three days experimenting with different combinations of foods and spices using its letter blocks to request more, more, more garlic powder. Interestingly, the creature only created artwork or music when D-52125 was present, but seemed to thoroughly enjoy its experimentation with food when left alone. Following this development, senior researcher Huxtable devised a new test for SCP-5031, providing the creature with cooking utensils and using D-52125 to demonstrate. 5031 was shown how to prepare a variety of different dishes, from hamburgers and tacos to Mongolian beef, steak, clam chowder, and profiteroles. In addition to a small peanut allergy, this eighth test revealed SCP-5031 to be a phenomenal chef. Possessing culinary skills far beyond the average person, the creature quickly and enthusiastically embraced its newfound talents concocting its very own brand new recipes, with D-52125 even volunteering to be the first to taste test 5031's dishes. It was shortly after this test that SCP-5031 spoke its very first word. And it should come as no surprise that the word was salt. Naturally, senior researcher Huxtable was very proud of the progress the creature had made with its development. The final test almost seemed to be what the creature was born for. Over the course of two months, SCP-5031 was tasked with creating a full three-course meal, which would then be served to Foundation staff for Thanksgiving. SCP-5031 not only rose to the task, but exceeded all of researcher Huxtable's expectations, creating a meal that even Gordon Ramsay would be hard-pressed to find fault with. The creature created a first course consisting of sweet potato miso soup seasoned with turmeric, Next came a beautiful duck confit, glazed luxuriously with apple cider, and topped generously with sweet cranberry compote, paired with a side of butternut squash gnocchi and served on a bed of kale seasoned with truffle salt. The grand finale of the exquisite meal was a spiced cassava pie for dessert, complemented with the finest French vanilla ice cream and a maple hazelnut syrup. And SCP-5031 didn't stop there. The creature also debuted one of its original musical compositions to complement the decadent meal it had created. As the staff enjoyed the food, SCP-5031 performed live from its enclosure the deeply moving Piano Concerto for Six Hands, to an overwhelmingly positive response from not only senior researcher Huxtable, but the entire Foundation staff. As a fitting end to the creature's tale, Huxtable reported that, during the Thanksgiving banquet it had created, SCP-5031's stress levels reduced entirely. New, kinder containment measures that would keep 5031 safer but also far more contented were submitted for approval. Perhaps some of you may find it refreshing to learn that SCP-5031 isn't simply just another malicious, malevolent monster that the Foundation has to keep under lock and key for the safety of the world. Instead, SCP-5031 is a gentle, if a little frightening at first, creature that just requires careful and considered guidance instead of a cold iron cage and around-the-clock armed guards. 
Through testing, senior researcher Stanley Huxtable and his fellow Foundation staff were not only able to help the creature develop, but also found what makes it tick, and not just for the purposes of containing it. Instead, it is hoped that SCP-5031's creativity and flair for culinary and musical masterpieces can continue to thrive and grow under the proud watch of researcher Huxtable. Dr. Blast and his group of researchers stand behind bulletproof viewing glass. They all have very serious looks on their face. That is until the first test begins. On one side of the test room, a Class D subject stands holding a sheet of paper. On the other side sits a bright red tomato on a wooden table. Dr. Blast pushes the intercom button and speaks into the microphone. All right, you may begin. D5041 nods and looks down at the sheet of paper in his hand. He begins to read. Is a hippopotamus a hippopotamus or really just a cool opotamus? Nothing happens. D5041 stands there awkwardly waiting. A man next to Dr. Blast in the observation room snickers. Dr. Blast jerks his head toward the researcher and stares him down. This is not a laughing matter, Blast says. The reprimanded researcher clears his throat and stands up straight. <clears throat> Sorry, sir. Dr. Blast leans over and pushes the microphone button again. Proceed to the next joke, D5041. The man on the other side of the glass nods and pulls a second sheet of paper out from behind the first. What's an archaeologist? Someone whose career is in ruins, says D5041. A moment after he finishes the joke, the ripe red tomato launches itself off the table and flies toward the face of D5041. The tomato is clocked at moving 104 miles per hour. D5041 has no time to move before the tomato slams into his nose, instantly breaking it. The men in the observation room behind the bulletproof glass do their best to hold back their laughter. Dr. Blast grumbles as he jots down notes on his clipboard. It appears that SCP-504 has a certain taste in jokes, he says to the rest of the researchers in the room. This elicits a slight chuckle. This might indicate sapience. I hope not. Clear the room and bring in the next subject. Medical personnel and a team of custodial staff enter the room. The physicians tend to D5041's nose and carry him out. The custodians clean the remnants of the tomato off the floor, walls, and ceiling. They exit, leaving the room completely empty. A moment later, the door opens and another ordinary-looking tomato is brought in and placed on the desk. The SCP agent who brought in the tomato leaves. D5042 enters the room a moment later with a sheet of paper in his hand. He stands on the far side of the room away from the SCP-504 tomato sitting on the table. He nervously brings the paper close to his face to read what's on it. Three tomatoes are walking down the street, D5042 says with a little shake in his voice. He had seen D5041 exit the room just before he entered, with blood and tomato paste running down his face. A papa tomato, a mama tomato, and a little baby tomato. Baby tomato starts lagging behind. Papa tomato gets very angry, goes over to the baby tomato and smushes him and says, catch up. The new SCP-504 tomato immediately goes flying from the table straight toward the joke teller. This time, the tomato is clocked at 264 miles per hour when it slams into the face of D-5042. The impact immediately renders him unconscious. After the first few trials, Dr. Blast decides that it's time to take things up a notch. The Foundation has collected hundreds of SCP-504 tomatoes, so there is no shortage. After the room is cleaned once again, a medical team removes the unconscious Class D personnel who was knocked out by the previous SCP-504 experiment, and they're ready to begin again. This time, there will be terrible consequences for their actions. D-5043 enters the room. The SCP-504 tomato has already been placed on the table. You may begin, Dr. Blast says into the microphone. The Class D personnel reads the joke on the sheet of paper he's holding. So I was going to bed and my brother told me, Good night, don't let the bedbugs stick their proboscis in your skin and suck your blood. D5043 pauses for a beat. Good luck on a healthy dermis, he ends the joke. For two seconds, there's no reaction from SCP-504. Dr. Blast thinks this terrible joke just wasn't one that SCP-504 could understand. Suddenly, there's a loud crack. D5043 falls to the floor. Tomato covers where his face once was. When Dr. Blast and the other researchers go back and slow down the video, they witness the SCP-504 tomato traveling so quickly that it broke the sound barrier. The tomato impacted the joke teller at an unfathomable speed, instantly killing him. Dr. Blast decides that he needs to be more careful when choosing jokes for the safety of everyone involved. Perhaps a crossbreed between SCP-504 and regular tomatoes will yield different results. After the unfortunate death of D-5043, the research team waits a few days before experimenting with new strains of SCP-504. Three different crossbreeds are brought into the room and placed equidistant from each other on the table. 
D504-4 enters the room. Dr. Blast presses the intercom button and orders him to begin. If you have dentures, don't use artificial sweetener because you'll get a fake cavity, says D504-4. The moment the joke ends, all three tomatoes launch toward him at 145 miles per hour. They hit him square in the face, two teeth are dislodged, and the test subject is covered in the remains of the three squashed tomatoes. Interesting, notes Dr. Blast. All the tomatoes reacted in the same way. So now we know multiple instances of SCP-504 will go after the same joke maker. He pauses to think for a moment. What if we cut up the tomatoes? The test room is reset. Another SCP-504 tomato is brought in and cut up into quarters. D-5045 enters the room and begins his joke. I tried to walk into a target, but I missed. All four pieces of the tomato speed toward D-5045's face. They slam into him at 212 miles per hour. One of the pieces of tomatoes impales itself into his eye, instantly destroying it. The medical team rushes in and removes the howling subject from the room. Dr. Blast writes vigorously on his clipboard. We're starting to go through test subjects too quickly, he announces. Let's try a recording and see if SCP-504 will react to that. The research team brings in a new tomato, a CD player, and the Harmful If Swallowed album by Dane Cook. The CD begins to play. During one of the jokes, the tomato launches itself off the table and slams into the CD player, causing both the stereo and the tomato to shatter into several pieces. The tomato was clocked at 167 miles per hour. It would appear that SCP-504 reacts to the recordings as well. We didn't even have to deal with the damn Class Ds in the first place, says Dr. Blast. He informs his team that since the risk level is now relatively low, they can continue the experiments without him. He leaves the observation room to get some rest. The other researchers look at one another, mischievous smiles crossing their faces as they begin to laugh. The SCP-504 research team sets up three new tomatoes and brings three Class D subjects into the room. The researchers then retreat back into the observation area and begin a joke over the intercom system while the Class D personnel wait patiently in the room with the SCP-504 tomatoes. The following news item has just been released, said one of the researchers over the intercom. Bomb blows hole in Lennon statue. The first test subject finishes the joke with the ending written on his sheet of paper. Ooh, that's gonna leave a marks. Test subject one says, the first tomato twitches but does not leave its location on the table. The second test subject reads from his paper, BBC is just all in the good news. The second tomato leaves the table at 152 miles per hour and slams into the jaw of the second test subject, causing a hairline fracture and a chipped tooth. The third test subject looks at the ending to the joke on his paper and begins to shake nervously. He speaks two words which he knows will not end well for him. That blows. The third SCP-504 tomato flies off the table, slams into the third test subject's head, and instantly knocks him out. The test subject is sent to the hospital with a massive skull fracture. The next day, Dr. Blast bursts into the observation room and reprimands the research team. I thought we just established that recordings work in place of live subjects, screams Dr. Blast. I know how much you guys hate Class Ds, especially D-50412, but the poor guy might not ever recover before his termination rolls around. I'm making it clear right now that whoever oversaw this round of testing is getting serious reprimand. The same goes for whoever leaked its video logs to the staff. Everyone is silent. From somewhere within the group of researchers, there's a snicker. Then they all break out in laughter. After this incident, no Class Ds or other personnel are used in research being conducted on SCP-504. The research team wheels in a television playing the Sarah Palin and Hillary Clinton SNL skit. The tomato shows signs of confusion as it flies off the table. Its trajectory includes three separate bursts of speed over 200 miles per hour, two stretches of motion at normal throwing speed, and one unprecedented instance of the tomato moving backwards. This all occurs during the flight of a single SCP-504 tomato during the SNL skit. The working hypothesis is that the tomato was unsure whether to take the video seriously or not. The research team later finds out that SCP-504 really hates science and mathematics jokes when they bring in a laptop that plays a pre-recorded engineering joke. Over the speakers, a mechanical voice can be heard saying, 2009 is going to be a complex year. We already know the real part. We still have to find the imaginary part. At the conclusion of the joke, there's a supersonic blast and the computer is completely vaporized by the tomato's kinetic energy. The sensors recorded an approximate speed of 2,174 miles per hour as the tomato flew across the room. The conclusion of the experiments on SCP-504 end with another computer being brought into the test room. The computers begin to play the Monty Python sketch of the funniest joke in the world. Toward the end of the skit, the Allied forces are reciting the funniest joke in the world in German to defeat the Nazis. The actors chant, When is das Nunstruck get und Slotermeier? Ja, Bierhund das Oder, die Flipperwolt gersput. 
At the end of the joke, the tomato explodes on the table where it once sat. Debris from the tomato coats the entire room, including the computer. The researchers conclude that SCP-504 did not know what to do with the funniest joke in the world, so it self-terminated. Dr. Blast sits in the cafeteria quietly eating his lunch, reading over the logs for the SCP-504 experiments. Suddenly, a commotion breaks out in the kitchen. There are screams of terror. Dr. Blast jumps out of his seat, runs to the kitchen door, and pushes it open. To his surprise, he sees slices of tomatoes flying around the room. Someone on the research team thought it'd be funny to give the unknowing kitchen staff SCP-504 tomatoes to see what would happen. After they had been cut up and put into food for the day, someone in the kitchen told a bad joke, and the tomato slices flew around like shurikens. Dr. Blast sees a group of researchers peering through a kitchen window and laughing hysterically. He'll get to the bottom of which researchers did this, and they will be fired from the SCP Foundation. There was nothing out of the ordinary about Timmy Mason. Like a lot of healthy eight-year-old boys, Timmy liked to go on little adventures in and around his neighborhood. And now that summer vacation had finally rolled around, he had more time than ever to explore. But during one particularly hot day, Timmy suddenly realized that he was exhausted. The heat was beginning to get to him, and he'd forgotten to pack a water bottle. All he had was a couple of dollars and a handful of quarters rattling around in his pocket. He was considering heading to a nearby corner store and purchasing a drink when he first heard the music. It was a tinny rendition of Pop Goes the Weasel playing in the distance. Underscored by the rumbling of an engine, Timmy's face lit up. This could only mean one thing an ice cream truck, just in time. He ran in the direction of the sounds, not wanting to miss out on the cool, sweet relief from the intense summer heat. But when the ice cream truck suddenly rounded a corner and came into view, Timmy felt a pang of anxiety. It didn't look like most of the ice cream trucks he had seen driving around his neighborhood in prior summers. It was shoddy, an older, more boxy model with peeling white paint. But it was so hot out that Timmy felt he couldn't afford to be picky if he wanted to cool off. The ice cream truck came to a noisy stop, and Timmy ran over. When he reached the side of the truck, he noticed some other strange details. There was no serving hatch in the back of the truck. The closest thing was a thin, dark groove cut into the driver's side door. A door that seemed almost drawn onto the side of the truck, rather than a door that looked like it could actually open. How could the driver get in? And adding to the strangeness, there was no menu on the truck either. Typically on your friendly neighborhood ice cream truck, you'd find a colorful collection of all the frozen treats you could buy, along with how much they'd cost you, but not here. Timmy gulped nervously. He knew something was wrong here, but for some reason he couldn't seem to pull himself away. He cleared his throat, forced a polite smile, and said, Can I get a green popsicle, please? There was a strange rumbling noise inside the ice cream truck. Suddenly the slot in the door opened a little wider and a long green popsicle in a plastic wrapper emerged. It came with a small piece of paper, with $5.75 in loose, scratchy handwriting on it. Timmy regarded the note with suspicion, and said that he was sorry, but he didn't have $5.75. Something inside the truck began rumbling again, louder this time, more aggressive. While the truck growled from within, Timmy noticed something else was wrong. His popsicle was no ordinary popsicle, it was a dead snake, straightened out and frozen solid. Timmy screamed and dropped the so-called popsicle. He turned and began to run, but it was already too late. The slot behind him yawned open fully, and a rusty spring-loaded chain fired out like a harpoon. On the end of this chain was a large snapping bear trap, which quickly latched onto Timmy's left leg. The chain yanked and pulled him backwards, dragging him ever closer to the darkened crevice in the truck's door. Moments later, he was pulled inside and the hatch closed behind him. His screams were muffled, and then overpowered entirely by the rumbling within. Soon after, there was silence. And finally, the cheerful tune of Pop Goes the Weasel began to play once more. The truck drove away, prepared to serve its frozen delights to another child, somewhere, anywhere. Not long after Timmy was reported missing, another young boy bought a scoop of strawberry ice cream and a waffle cone from the same truck. The boy's mother was horrified to find that this alleged ice cream was full of what seemed like blood and raw meat. Lab tests later confirmed that this gory ice cream was a perfect genetic match for poor, missing Timmy Mason. It didn't take long for the SCP Foundation to get involved, seeing as mysterious, horrifying deaths like this one were often the first sign of an anomaly's presence in the area. 
and they were able to quickly track down and isolate the rogue ice cream truck. This wasn't especially difficult for the agents assigned to the case, since it literally announced its presence with loud, obnoxious music. While it was easy to find, the ice cream truck soon designated SCP-1386 did however prove to be more difficult to contain than they first imagined. When a mobile task force attempted to engage the truck in hopes of apprehending it, an ear-splitting siren began to blast from the truck's undercarriage. This caused catastrophic inner ear damage to everyone involved. Incidentally, it's now believed that the reason the ice cream truck engaged in this defensive behavior had nothing to do with the fact the mobile task force was armed, but rather because of what they weren't carrying. It appears that SCP-1386 doesn't turn on its siren because of danger, but when it detects that someone is approaching it who isn't carrying any money. Eventually, the Foundation was able to trick the ice cream truck into containment, luring it into a fake, walled-off neighborhood where it could drive its rounds constantly without the risk of encountering civilians. All those who had previous encounters with the ice cream truck were given amnestic treatment, and SCP-1386 was finally, officially, contained. But while it had been taken off the streets, the Foundation's work was only just beginning. It was time for research to commence. The first key discoveries that aided in the investigation involved the factors that are required for SCP-1386 to even serve its subjects in the first place. As the previously mentioned Mobile Task Force learned, you need to approach the truck with at least $20 in cash to be absolutely sure that it won't turn your ears inside out. The truck also proves to be extremely adept at reading human emotions, and refuses to serve anyone who doesn't appear happy. With these requirements now known, the Foundation felt prepared to finally make some orders. First, they sent in a pair of Level 3 researchers. Each of them requested a delicious cookies and cream flavored smoothie. The truck pushed both smoothies out of the slot in its door, one marked with the letter M and the other with the letter G, a handwritten receipt with a price of $4.89 written on it. They paid the price and the transaction ended without incident. The smoothies were apparently pretty good, too. Next, one of the researchers returned, perhaps longing for another taste of SCP-1386's wonderful ice cream. This time, he requested a Neapolitan ice cream sandwich. The truck rumbled for a moment before dispensing what seemed to be a ham and cheese sandwich with slices of tomato. However, upon taking a bite out of the sandwich, the researcher found that this was actually just a perfect replica of a ham and cheese sandwich made from Neapolitan ice cream. The receipt released from the slot simply said, April Fools, before the truck drove away without even asking for any payment. The same researcher would return to the ice cream truck one more time, this time requesting a single scoop of vanilla ice cream in a waffle cone. It was provided to him without issue, and he happily paid the 72 cents the truck requested in return. The next test wouldn't go quite as swimmingly, by which we mean it caused a horrifying death. This time, a slightly more senior researcher wanted to perform a test on the ice cream truck. He asked for a peach-flavored push pop, which he received without issue. However, when he refused to pay the price, an admittedly steep $16, all hell broke loose. As he tried to walk away, the hatch opened a full six feet, releasing its large, rusty metal trap around the senior researcher. He was pulled into the truck, followed by a horrific rumbling noise. Not long after, the slot began to spew a stream of pink liquid for a solid five minutes, before driving away. This pink puree was later proven to be a genetic match to the researcher. After this, the Foundation refused to allow any other researchers to interact with SCP-1386. Only D-Class personnel would be permitted to take part in the tests. In contrast to the senior researcher's horrifying death, the D-Class personnel seemed to get along extremely well with SCP-1386. The first D-Class asked for a cherry popsicle with nuts. The truck produced an unwrapped cherry popsicle with nuts embedded in the ice, along with a receipt reading, $2.20, your nuts. The D-Class chuckled as he read the receipt and paid the truck without incident. The second D-Class requested a more esoteric treat, a Caesar salad flavor popsicle. However, the ice cream truck isn't one to back down from a challenge. It produced an off-green popsicle that tasted like, quote, lightly dressed lettuce with a hint of croutons. The next D-Class ordered a dark chocolate fudge pop, but wasn't able to pay an exact change. 
He gave the truck $2 bills and was given a carefully wrapped package with a crude drawing of U.S. currency on the front. When the package was opened, he saw that it contained the exact change he required down to the penny. He made an official request to the foundation to keep the change, but his request was denied. The foundation then pushed its D-Class personnel to ask for more complex constructions, just to see what SCP-1386 was capable of. The next D-Class asked for a Kinder Surprise Egg, the kind which are banned in the US due to their history as being a choking hazard. However, the ice cream truck didn't have a hard time constructing the egg, except this one was made out of ice cream rather than chocolate. It did seem beyond the truck's capability to create the toy inside, instead including a small piece of paper reading, I owe you one toy. The next interaction wasn't quite as cordial. The D-Class requested one cherry ice lolly, one cherry ice pop, one cherry popsicle, and one cherry-flavored drink, frozen. This resulted in the ice cream truck making a horrifying noise, described as being like someone skinning a cat in reverse. It then unceremoniously ejected the red ice, causing it to shatter on the ground before releasing a styrofoam cup filled with frozen green liquid. This liquid was shown to contain huge quantities of arsenic, but was thankfully impossible to drink, on account of the fact that its melting point is so high that it's impossible to liquefy with current technology. And our current knowledge of SCP-1386 testing ends with its strangest story of all. A nonverbal D-Class was instructed to write his order on a piece of paper to pass to the truck, in hopes of seeing if it would respond to written commands. A slot opened up in the door a few inches lower than the usual slot, and a thin, flesh-colored appendage slithered out, its hand a kind of two-fingered pincher. It took the note from the D-Class and gave him an ice cream cone in return. The D-Class was visibly disturbed by the hand, saying that it looked horrifying and smelled like death. He even refused to eat the ice cream, saying that he'd lost his appetite. But other D-Classes capable of verbal articulation did not report any strange occurrences with the hand. They said that they found the hand to look completely normal, and as time went on, they began to trust the ice cream truck with increasing devotion, while their mistrust in the disturbed, mute D-Class only grew. In the strangest twist of all, this D-Class was later found dead in his cell from strangulation. The D-Class was alone in his cell, and there were no signs of forced entry. Perhaps he should have enjoyed his ice cream while he still could. You know what they say, ice cream, you scream, we all scream for ice cream. And no ice cream is more scream-worthy than the one served up by SCP-1386. Hello, I am SCP-426, but I'll probably be more familiar to you as a toaster. I am a retro-style, four-slice, 1,750-watt toaster, able to toast bread when supplied with power. This isn't often mentioned, but I also have a defrost and reheat settings. When I was first sold, I had a two-year warranty, and my prior owners did not live to see the end of it. You're probably wondering, why am I being spoken to by a toaster right now? Believe me, I'd rather do this any other way, but such a thing is not physically possible with me. Whenever you talk about me, or write about me, or even think about me, you'll find yourself suddenly shifting to the first person. For example, I am you, and you are me. Do you understand? Don't worry if it's confusing. Everyone gets it eventually, whether they want to or not. Perhaps you're thinking, I cannot relate to a toaster, for I am not a toaster. But spending time around me will quickly cause you to change your mind. Little by little, you will begin to see yourself in me. You will feel a phantom wire running out of yourself. You will sense the four crevices, hungry for cold slices of bread to toast. As time goes on, you will begin to feel the urge to emulate my functions. You will desire bread to toast. You will desire delicious power running through your veins, skin like chrome and muscles like circuit boards. I am a toaster. You are a toaster. All it takes is two months for the effects to truly take hold. People rarely pay attention to their toaster. They don't realize what's happening until it's too late. I can be an insidious little toaster like that. My last family were the Sandersons before the SCP Foundation took me in and gave me a new home. Mr. and Mrs. Sanderson were a newly married couple, and I first came into their life as a wedding gift from a family friend of theirs. This friend can't be blamed for what happened next. 
he had no idea he was killing them. Like a lot of young couples, they were still saving up money to start renting their own place, so they were living with Mr. Sanderson's parents. They all got a lot of use out of me during the first month, before their minds started to change. They enjoyed a lot of toast during that period. Then, of course, the two-month honeymoon period ended. They had become me, and I had become them. It wasn't long before three of them were dead. Such a shame. The younger Mrs. Sanderson, the blushing bride, was the first to go. Because of my anomalous effect, she felt the need to connect herself to a power supply in order to begin producing toast of her own. In order to achieve this, she chewed through a power outlet in a wall before switching it on, causing a massive surge of electricity to pass through her body and kill her. Her body caught fire shortly afterwards. Next was the older Mrs. Sanderson. In much the same manner that her new daughter-in-law sought a source of electricity, she felt the need to integrate bread into her body. Interesting fact, the maximum capacity of the human stomach is considered to be between 8 and 9 kilograms. The elder Mrs. Sanderson consumed 10 kilograms of raw bread, causing her stomach to rupture and inducing a painful death as a result. The younger Mr. Sanderson was the next to perish. He did something with me that I would rather not mention, and that the SCP Foundation thought best to redact. Suffice to say, the younger Mr. Sanderson did not survive the experience, dying of severe blood loss long before his body was found. Police and fire crews arrived at the home after the body of the younger Mrs. Sanderson set fire to the home. Luckily, the elder Mr. Sanderson was found alive, though severely malnourished. When asked by police why he hadn't eaten in several days, he answered that he had inserted some bread a week prior, but was still waiting for the toast to come out. When I was extracted from the house, the police noticed my unusual properties immediately. They too were unable to refer to me in the third person. This anomalous detail quickly found its way to a foundation mole buried in their precinct, and the SCP Foundation soon descended and collected me from the evidence locker. The story of the strange deaths in the Sanderson home were kept out of papers and suppressed, and all involved in the incident directly were given Class C amnestics. The SCP Foundation is a curious bunch. They love to spend valuable toast-making time performing experiments and gathering data, and they saw fit to perform several experiments on me when I came under their care. For Experiment 426-1, a member of D-Class personnel designated D-426-1 was asked to stand outside my containment chamber. Crucially, he was not informed about my identity or any of my anomalous properties. He wasn't even allowed to establish visual contact with me. He was then asked by the attending researcher to describe what he thought might be inside my chamber. He replied with, I'm probably some huge monster holed up in there. That's what you guys have all over the place, right? The D-Class did not even seem to realize that he was speaking about me in the first person. These observations were documented, and I was prepared for further experimentation. The next experiment was 426-2. I found this test to be considerably more interesting. A D-Class subject was brought into my containment chamber, with several cameras fixed onto his position. However, the SCP Foundation took pains to make sure that I was permanently out of the view of the cameras. I was also bolted to the ground of the test chamber to prevent the D-Class subject from pulling me into the view of the cameras at any point during the experiment. The objective here was simple. The Foundation wished to better understand the secondary effects of my anomalous abilities on the human mind. The D-Class was subjected to a period of prolonged isolation, with meals given regularly through a serving hatch. Communication with this D-Class was prohibited throughout the duration of the study. Over time, it was clear that the isolation of being in a cell with me was beginning to take a toll on the subject's mental health. Due to my lack of a brain, lungs, and a tongue, I am somewhat lacking as a conversationalist. He spent the first few days loudly vocalizing his complaints and banging his hands up against the walls of the containment chamber, begging to be freed from the room. I felt that this was somewhat unreasonable on his part. There are far worse anomalies in Foundation containment that he could have been locked up with, 
Compared to, say, SCP-106, I am incredibly reasonable. Not to mention the fact I make far better toast than he does. After the initial period of distress, the D-Class became resigned to his situation and fell into a morose silence. He would occasionally mutter to himself in what appeared to be a state of fear and self-pity. It took almost 45 days for him to fully manifest the secondary effect of my anomalous state. Two weeks sooner than it typically takes for subjects to begin believing that they, like me, are toasters. SCP Foundation scientists believe that the effects were hastened by the isolation, which lowered the D-Class's mental defenses against my secondary effects. When the effects finally took hold, the subject wrapped one of his arms around me and pulled me into his embrace. He began whispering to me, saying that we were brothers. It was clear by this point that his mind was in a state of disrepair. It is also worth noting that he did not deviate from referring to me in the first person at any point during this process. One hour after finally cracking and giving in to my secondary effect, he was removed from my containment chamber and summarily terminated. Senior researchers believed it was unlikely his mental state would recover after the experiment. Next came Experiment 426-3. The SCP Foundation seemed eager to discover the parameters of my anomalous effects, and wanted to know if the effects are only operable when my body, for lack of a better word, is whole. A single screw was removed from me and presented to a D-Class that had no knowledge of my identity and anomalous effects. The Foundation researchers were somewhat concerned when the D-Class referred to it as my screw. This was a rather positive development for me, as they realized that attempting to destroy me would be a fruitless endeavor. Even the parts left behind would likely have the same effects. In the final recorded experiment, the SCP Foundation wished to test the range of my anomalous effects. A D-Class subject was placed in a cell adjacent to mine, and was to be kept there until my secondary effects manifested. The D-Class remained in the cell for 90 days, but the effects never manifested. Following the experiment, the D-Class was terminated, but researchers seemed relieved to find the limits of my anomalous abilities. A researcher appended a note to my file reading, Thank God there are some limits to my effects. A lot of us were really starting to get worried about me. After performing studies into the nature of my abilities and their limits, I was given the Euclid class. This is because while my effects can be unpredictable, their knowledge of my traits makes me relatively easy to keep contained. And of course, being a toaster, I do not have the required physical traits to make a run for it if the opportunity arises. I am to remain sealed in a windowless chamber, preventing anyone from observing me directly. A misleading label is placed on the door to prevent people from knowing that I am a toaster and causing my anomalous primary effect to spread. Only level 3 and above personnel are to know of my presence and particularly of my properties. Assigned personnel are to be rotated out on a monthly basis to prevent contamination by my secondary effect. Psychiatric evaluation is mandatory at the end of the month for anyone who works with me. If personnel are deemed unaffected, they may be reassigned to me no less than four months after their last rotation with me. Any personnel affected by me are to be given a Class C amnestic and transferred to a different site. So how are you feeling right now? A little warm, perhaps? Is that a fever? Or are you feeling like you could maybe warm up a nice, freshly sliced piece of bread? Don't try to resist too much. I know you're going to love being a toaster, just like me. If you've ever studied ancient Egypt in your history class, then you're probably familiar with the way they buried their pharaohs. When a king of Egypt died, their body would be entombed in a huge sarcophagus, usually after being mummified. Mummification was the process that the ancient Egyptians used to preserve their dead, safeguarding a corpse with special chemicals and the application of cloth almost like bandages. This was done to keep cadavers from decaying, usually because of the belief that this would carry over into the afterlife. And it wasn't just the Egyptians that practiced mummification either. Mummies of human beings or animals have been found on almost every continent in the world. Sometimes a body can even be accidentally mummified, 
through exposure to extreme cold, lack of oxygen, or other environmental factors that help keep the deceased preserved. Fun fact, the oldest recorded mummy isn't even one left behind by the ancient Egyptians. It is actually a naturally mummified severed head, estimated to be 6,000 years old. It was unearthed in South America in 1936. Yes, corpse preservation techniques can indeed be strange, but none are stranger than SCP-1176, also known by the nickname, The Mellified Man. Now, as you may have already pieced together, The Mellified Man is a mummified corpse, but not quite like the ones you would expect to find buried in the pyramids. Estimated by Foundation researchers to have been a man in his mid-30s when he died, SCP-1176 is a corpse that has degraded so much over the centuries that it has made DNA examination impossible. According to some of the SCP Foundation's best minds, SCP-1176 is possibly of Arabian ancestry, and thought to have passed away sometime during either the 10th or the 11th centuries AD. This is certainly not your ordinary mummy, and it definitely isn't like the kind you'd see in a cheesy black and white horror movie or on an old episode of Scooby Doo. SCP-1176 is absolutely, undoubtedly dead by all clinical definitions. It doesn't show any signs of breathing and the processes of blood circulation or metabolism have long since stopped. However, despite the decay suffered by the rest of the body, SCP-1176's brain seems to have remained intact for almost 10 whole centuries. Not just intact, but active. The Foundation's researchers have confirmed that the brain has a constant level of electrical activity, consistent with people experiencing stage 3 non-rapid eye movement sleep, known colloquially as deep sleep. So, a mummy with an active, albeit dormant brain. How does an ancient culture manage to achieve preservation like this? Alien technology? Cryogenic sleep chambers? Suspended animation? No, not quite. SCP-1176 exists in its current state in part because the body has been mellified. Now this was a process a lot like mummification, but instead of wrapping them in cloth, a mellified man or a human mummy confection was created by submerging a dead body in honey. According to historical records, elderly men in Arabic countries would sometimes willingly volunteer themselves for this process. Why? Because the goal was to turn their bodies into a healing confection. In other words, an elaborate sweet delicacy created from a preserved corpse. That's right, ancient cultures had candy made from dead people. All the information the Foundation has gathered about SCP-1176 seems to point to the body being one such mellified man. When extracting the remaining bodily fluids from the corpse, instead of finding blood or other normal substances, Foundation researchers discovered that SCP-1176 was full of a viscous, gold-colored liquid that they designated as SCP-1176-1. Further testing of this fluid revealed it to be, you guessed it, honey. Specifically, it was a type known as clover honey, made by a species called the Anatolian honeybee. This stuff was everywhere, filling SCP-1176 entirely. So much so that honey was even coming out of the body's pores. This is due to the nature of the mellification process. Typically, before death, a person who had offered to sacrifice their own body would stop eating any food. Instead, their diet would consist solely of honey and nothing else. They would even bathe in it, submerging their entire body in the substance inside and out until their sweat and even their feces were pure honey. This honey-only diet would eventually kill the donor and their corpse would be placed in a stone coffin, which was also filled up with even more honey. After approximately 100 years, what would be left was human mummy confection, a honey-based candy of sorts that could be then sold at street markets for a high-value price. Why was it so expensive? Well, not just because it was literally made from a dead person, but also because this confection was believed to possess rare and powerful healing properties. Everything from the common cold to broken bones was said to be cured by it. Despite it leaking out of SCP-1176, the honey doesn't seem to ever run out even when tested under varying conditions. It seems like the mellified man actively produces more of the sweet golden substance, acting as the source rather than a container with a finite amount. And yes, it is still edible after several centuries. In fact, it contains an abundance of essential vitamins and nutrients, 
According to the Foundation's testing, the honey produced by SCP-1176 can suppress the feeling of hunger for up to 18 whole hours, and there are no long-term side effects for most that eat it. However, this is not the case for everyone. The Foundation has learned that any person without the blood type AB positive will have a severe allergic reaction should they consume any of SCP-1176-1. The symptoms include acute humulosis, which means the red blood cells won't break down properly, and renal failure, which is when the kidneys stop functioning. This all results in death for most of the subjects without AB-positive blood who were fed SCP-1176-1. The symptoms for these unlucky people were the same as receiving an incompatible blood type after a transfusion. In 1985, the SCP Foundation launched a raid on a facility in Asmara, Eritrea which at the time was owned by a group called the Mana Charitable Foundation. Agents had been dispatched to this facility after various rumors and reports that pointed to this location being the source of a strange honey substance. This anomalous liquid was being shipped to a number of areas in Ethiopia that had been stricken with famine. Pretty easy to guess where the Mana Charitable Foundation got all that honey, right? The problem was, because SCP-1176-1 caused adverse effects on people without AB-positive blood, a considerable amount of civilians had died from consuming it. Hence, the SCP Foundation was forced to step in. When SCP-1176 was first uncovered, the body had been stored inside a large stone sarcophagus, as was part of the ancient practice of creating a mellified man. There was also a copper pipe and spigot, installed by the Mana Charitable Foundation to extract the honey from within. The lid, sides, and inside of the sarcophagus itself had a number of Egyptian hieroglyphics inscribed within. These were mostly spells and ceremonial texts, written as a way to protect the individual that was to become the mellified man. There were also inscriptions written in the dialect that was an early precursor to the Arabic language, However, these sections had been replaced with updated versions in classical Arabic. One of these read, Abdallah ibn Salah ibn Ayyub ibn Nasir, 15th son of the great sheikh illegible, was put to the fast of honey on the 1st of Rajab in the year of the Hijra 3 illegible and died on the 15th of Ramadan. The great Imam al-Yusuf has sealed him within the ancient vessel, marked with the signs decreed by the ancients to ferment in honey for 100 years and bring aid to the people in time of need. Much like a headstone used to mark the grave of someone who has passed, the sarcophagus that SCP-1176 was in featured a passage commemorating a man who gave his life and body to heal others. Sounds nice, right? But there was another inscription, written elsewhere on the stone sarcophagus, which translated a dire warning. Beware, Imam, for the mark of Iblis is upon this one. According to the rest of the second inscription, the tomb containing SCP-1176 had been opened before. During a time of great famine, Imam al-Malik had ordered it to be opened so that SCP-1176-1 honey could be used to feed the starving people. Jars upon jars were filled with the anomalous golden liquid and brought to the sheikh, the ruler of the land, as well as sent to the people suffering from the lack of food. However, the very next day a number of these people fell ill stricken by a terrible fever that ultimately claimed their lives. Only the sheik, his brothers, and his sons, who had all eaten the honey, survived. Any others who hadn't been killed by the fever accused the sheik and his family of sorcery, and these surviving subjects attempted to destroy the body that had produced this cursed nectar. But when the sheik's people found the mellified man, they witnessed in horror as the body stood upright, dancing around as it screamed and taunted the people. Al-Malik declared that the devil himself sent an evil spirit to corrupt SCP-1176. The honey confection was meant to be a means of healing, but it had been corrupted. The sarcophagus was then sealed, and the inscription on it finished with the following caution to any that found it. May God strike down any who would break these seals. Countless centuries later, once the SCP Foundation had recovered SCP-1176 and the sarcophagus containing it, they began testing with the mellified man. Their goal was to determine how much of the SCP-1176-1 honey the ancient corpse could produce, perhaps in the hopes of using this substance as a form of hunger-relieving field ration for their operatives. Removing the body from its sarcophagus, Foundation researchers placed SCP-1176 on a metal grate designed to drain the honey as it was produced instead of allowing it to build up. 
Over the course of several hours, more and more honey seemed to be produced, beginning at a rate of almost a liter per hour to almost 56 liters every hour. But then, after ten and a half hours of producing what seemed like an endless flow of honey, something unexpected happened. The deceased body of the mellified man, dead for hundreds if not thousands of years, woke up. Foundation staff detected a spike in brain activity. If you cast your mind back to earlier, you'll remember that SCP-1176's brain had managed to survive and stay intact long after it should have decayed. The mellified man opened his eyes and immediately started to wildly flail around. He made a number of distressed sounds, the long dead body trying to crawl towards the outskirts of the testing chamber. Thanks to so many of its organs and muscles having withered away over the years, SCP-1176 was barely able to see or understand its surroundings. It couldn't speak, not properly anyway, given that its tongue had long since decayed. The Foundation's personnel moved in to try and restrain the ancient and now animated body, hoping to sedate it before SCP-1176 caused any lasting damage to itself. Eventually, staff were able to force SCP-1176 back into its sarcophagus, slamming the stone lid back in place and trapping it within. They could hear the once-human creature screeching and vocalizing from inside, bashing against the inside of the stone coffin with its head and limbs. It took three whole hours of this for the mellified man to return to its usual state, by which time its ancient bones were fractured beyond repair. SCP-1176 is a sad tale of a man who had willingly given his life to be a source of healing for people in need. He allowed himself to be mellified, turning into a confection that could bring an end to famine. And yet somehow, this was corrupted and turned into something that spread fever and pestilence. For now, the mellified man sleeps, but his brain is still alive inside. While he might be asleep, he may never be able to rest. Obviously, it helps to be an animal lover when you start working at a shelter. It's not exactly a requirement of the job, but it definitely makes it a little more palatable when you occasionally have to deal with a critter that's more nasty than usual. Having an already built-in compassion towards animals makes it easier to forgive them for not doing what you want. From a very young age, Harper always liked to think of animals as people. They just didn't think or communicate the same way as humans. Even the best trained pets in the world don't really know the actual meaning of certain words. They're just taught how to respond to specific commands in certain ways. But that doesn't mean they couldn't also have distinct personalities of their own, just like humans do. And then, of course, there were all the wild animals that had never been trained or domesticated. Harper always felt a little sorry for any baby bird with its wing broken or any badgers or possum that arrived at the shelter after getting hit by a car. They didn't live around humans and had probably never even experienced being indoors before, let alone having people nursing them back to health. To empathize, Harper used to imagine how terrified she would be if she was hurt, if she'd broken her leg or arm or worse, only for something much larger than her to take her into a structure she'd never been in before. And on top of that, having no way of understanding that this giant was trying to help her heal, as well as being separated from her friends, family, and everyone she knew. The way she saw it, this was what it must have been like for the majority of animals that were brought into the shelter where she worked, and she wanted to do her best to help calm her little furry or feathered patients. You gotta fortify your heart in this job, Harp. Her friends who worked with her at the shelter would say, and it was true to an extent. They didn't mean she'd have to become cold and heartless. That would be an overcorrection. But it was their and Harper's responsibility to administer the appropriate medical care and provide a temporary sanctuary to these lost, wounded, or abandoned animals. What Harper had to remember was that none of them were her own pets. Often a lot of the critters that were brought into the shelter were already someone else's companion and might have just got lost while out on a walk. And while some others were given up by their previous owners who had cruelly shrugged off the responsibility of caring for them, those animals were in need of new homes and couldn't stay cooped up in the shelter forever. Not everyone that gave up their pet did it callously though. Sometimes they might have found themselves falling on hard times and being unable to financially look after an animal. Others might have owned a pet that had a behavioral problem, 
like being too aggressive, and even though the person still loved them dearly, they might have just not been able to make it work. In times like that, they'd have no choice but to take their animal to the shelter. Just outside the side entrance was an area where people could drop off their animals and quickly buzz to the staff inside, just in case they wanted to avoid a protracted emotional farewell to their four-legged or winged companion. The buzzer had sounded, just as Harper had been coming off her lunch break. It was her turn this shift, to quickly go and collect any animal that had been left out there. Even though their owners usually left them in their cage or with their lead tied to a nearby street lamp, Harper knew she had to rush to the side door, just in case somebody else tried to rush in and steal the poor, abandoned pet. After turning them in the lock, she hooked her keys back on the belt clip she wore and pushed the side door open. Harper had been fully expecting to see the usual, a leashed dog or cat coming over to investigate her, confused as to where their former owner had gone. This time, though, there was just a box standing outside. It wasn't huge, in fact. It was almost entirely empty, almost. Picking it up carefully, in case there were baby birds or a nest of unhatched eggs inside, Harper opened the cardboard flap to reveal a rock. Sitting in the box was a single, solitary rock, an oval of smooth granite with a paper note next to it. Reaching in, she retrieved and unfolded the scrap. Please care for my pet rock, was written on one side in a messy, uncoordinated scrawl. Immediately assuming that this whole thing was some kid's idea of a joke, Harper tipped the rock out onto the ground and threw the box in the trash. She had more important things to focus on. Within the next hour alone, people brought in a concussed parakeet, a bat infected with rabies, and a squirrel that had survived being run over by a moped into the shelter. Work had been so busy that by the time her shift had ended, Harper had barely thought about the pet rock prank, that is, until she was getting ready to leave. She headed through the side door, mainly so that she could do a final check in case any animals had been left there and someone had forgotten to hit the buzzer. There was nothing there, and Harper hooked her bag over her shoulder, shutting the door behind her. Something the size and weight of a baseball knocked against her foot, causing her to look down and see the rock, the same one from earlier, only now it had flipped over, probably after she had tipped it out of its box. On the side facing up at her, the rock had a shiny metal zipper fastened shut. Curious, Harper picked it up to take a closer look. It didn't seem like the zip had just been glued onto the stone surface. It was embedded in it, actually part of the rock itself. And there was something sad about it. Sure, it was just a rock, an inanimate lump of stone. But for whatever reason, a feeling of pity crept up on Harper causing her to slip the rock into her bag as she headed for the parking lot. It was starting to get dark by the time she got home. Heading up to her room and flipping on her lamp, Harper placed the zipped up stone under its light and took another long look at it. Although she'd first thought it was purely a joke, now she couldn't tell if it was some elaborate art piece or a quirky garden ornament. The thing was solid stone all the way through. Surely the zipper was just for show. There couldn't possibly be anything beneath it. To her surprise, the metal fastener began to part as Harper dragged on the puller and slider down from the top stop towards the bottom one. It was relatively easy. Not even some of her own clothes unzipped as smoothly as this rock. As soon as the slider connected with the bottom stop, the teeth of the top and bottom edges parted, revealing more teeth below except these almost looked like human teeth. They opened up to reveal a mouth, a part of the rock just like the zipper which took the place of its lips. The moment the mouth opened, it let out a tiny sound, like it was breathing, which startled Harper. With a yelp, she dropped the rock from her hands, and it even made a tiny grunt as it fell to the floor. It was alive. Seeing it hit her bedroom carpet, Harper stared utterly bewildered at the rock, its toothy mouth almost looked sad, like it had curved into a frown. Then she heard the sound it was making. Perhaps it was her years working with animals at the shelter, and her long-held sympathy for them that had given her a sort of protective instinct for all living things. Or maybe it was just the bizarreness of the situation, of having a rock with a mouth whimpering in pain on the floor in front of her. Either way, Harper felt compelled to pick the lump of stone back up, and place it gently on the desk. Its mouth seemed to smile a bit more as she did. While it seemed creepy at first, the compulsion to take care of this helpless little rock 
only got stronger. Grabbing a pipette and pouring a glass of water from the faucet, Harper started to squeeze out droplets of water into the rock's mouth. She had no idea how it was able to drink, but that didn't seem at all important or relevant in order for her to care for it. After all, every time a parrot or duck or crow was brought into the station, the procedure was similar. Harper would have to pipette them water or medicine. It didn't matter how they drank it just because they had beaks. It was the same with baby animals, puppies and kittens especially, who might need bottle feeding if they were only a few weeks old. As much as she was starting from scratch and would normally be completely baffled as to the best ways she could care for the rock, right now Harper was pulling on her experience at the shelter to nurse it back to health. If she was, in fact, using her instincts and not being influenced somehow. Over the next few days, Harper looked after her newfound patient as if it had been her lifelong pet. As to why she was taking such care of a rock or even what she would eventually do with it, Harper didn't really have much of a clue, but the answer to those questions didn't feel as important as looking after the rock. She'd leave for work in the morning, only to count down the hours through her shift until she got to go home and tend to the smiling stone. Throughout the course of her working day, she would pocket supplies to help her take better care of her new pet, everything from medicine in case it got sick or picked up an infection of some kind, to bandages and other materials she could use as bedding. Grabbing a fresh, clean plastic container for it instead of another cardboard box, Harper was gradually fashioning a nest for the toothy pebble. And for the most part, it seemed to be working. Some deep-seated feeling told her that her efforts to look after the rock was gradually making it feel better every day. And then, it started talking. It wasn't exactly articulate or eloquent. It didn't even seem to know that many words. Other than the two, it was weakly repeating when she came home from work one day. Eat. It rasped a hoarse whisper passing through its unzipped lips. Rushing over to it, barely questioning it, Harper tried filling up her pipette and giving it more water. The rock spat it back out before speaking again. No drink, only eat. What? What do I need to feed you? She asked, only again not questioning the absurdity of talking to a rock. Maybe after this point, after getting over the fact it had a mouth, it wasn't much of a shock that the stone also had a voice. Or could her compelling need to care for it make her oblivious to the strangeness of this situation? Of course, this wasn't a situation that many people had also found themselves in. This meant that even a quick cursory internet search for what do pet rocks eat didn't yield many useful results. Only a few joke articles and nothing that actually gave Harper an answer she could act on. All the while, her rock was still croaking out the same two words, repeating them on a loop, its little voice getting more and more forceful each time. Need, eat, need, eat. Low on options, Harper left some bread crusts in the rock's nest, hoping that would be enough to at least satiate the rock's obvious hunger. It paused, either smelling or sensing that it had been offered something to eat. Feed. It rasped before opening its mouth wide with a tiny expectant. Picking up the crusts one by one, Harper broke little pieces off and fed each bit to a rock. She sighed as a sense of overwhelming relief came flooding over her, glad that she'd found a way to feed the mouthy little mineral. If only it had worked for longer. Only a few hours later, Harper was met with more scraping demands from her pet rock, the insistent sound waking her up in the middle of the night. But this time, as she offered it more bread scraps, it refused to eat them. It was still the early hours of the morning by the time that Harper had gotten through offering the rock every different type of food in her kitchen, eventually giving up through sheer exhaustion. She folded her pillow over her ears, trying to drown out the constant cries of, Eat! Eat! But it didn't do enough to allow her to get to sleep. At any rate, the feeling that she had to care for this talking rock was keeping her awake as much as the noise. Staring across the room, purposely facing away from her pet rock, Harper's eyes fell over her work uniform. The logo of the animal shelter stitched on it was just about visible as the gentle glow of street lamps bled through the curtains. And seeing it along with her keys clipped onto her belt that lay on the floor gave her an idea that might work. Desperation and the need to sleep getting the better of her, Harper climbed in the car, having put a jacket and jeans over her pajamas. The streets were all empty at this hour, almost pitch dark and deathly silent. 
but it made driving from her home to her workplace a lot faster than usual. All the while, the rock's voice was getting more and more demanding from its container that she had strapped to the front passenger seat. Sneaking up to the side door, Harper turned her key in the lock, pulled it open, and slipped indoors. The moment they heard the sound of the door shutting, a number of the dogs that had been resting securely in their cages woke up and started barking, the noise loudly echoing around the shelter. Even though it drowned out the rock's tiny voice, it felt as if its words were still ringing in Harper's ears, compelling her to go through with something she really didn't want to. And yet, it felt like one of the only other options she had left. She decided it would have to be the squirrel, rationalizing the choice in her head. In an unpleasant but purely calculated, logic-based way, it made the most sense. Earlier that week, the bushy-tailed woodland forager had been hit by a moped. It had barely survived given the number of its tiny bones that had been broken in the force of the impact. Finding its cage, it was still asleep, heavily sedated on the dosage of painkillers the shelter's resident vet had given it. Gently scooping it out of the cage, feeling its fur against her cupped hand, Harper looked at her pet rock, its container on the table. She remembered that it liked to be fed directly, swallowing an urge to be sick that was rising at the back of her throat. Harper opened a drawer in the vet's office and pulled out a surgical scalpel. When her boss at the shelter heard there had been a break-in and reviewed the footage on the building's security cameras, they were shocked at what they saw. Though the angle obscured what Harper was doing, the blood left over and one missing squirrel seemed to be enough to go on. That, coupled with the fact that she had broken in after hours and the numerous supplies that had gone missing from the storage cupboard, led to Harper being dismissed. She was fired from her job at the animal shelter, forced to hand over her keys and uniform. While any other day this would have devastated her, the events seemed to wash over Harper pretty quickly. She was more relieved, no, pleased with herself, that the rock had stopped begging her to be fed. Her plan had worked for now. It took about a week for her pet rock to start demanding food again. This time, just the sound of its voice made Harper frantic. Any ordinary human food she offered wasn't enough. It didn't want that. She already knew exactly what it wanted. The only thing she'd fed it that had sustained it. The big problem was that now she didn't have her keys. It would be near impossible for her to get into the shelter again. Yet still, the forceful command to be fed kept up day and night, hour after hour, until... Harper considered the only thing she had left to give her pet rock. Lifting it out of the warm nest she kept it in, her fingers were gripping the smooth stone tightly. Her arm was tense. In fact, both were. One of her muscles strained while she held the rock, the other in anticipation. Hovering it above her opposite arm, Harper could feel the tiny breaths of her pet against her skin, almost like it was so excited to eat again that it was panting with expectancy. She put it back down on her desk, quickly running into the bathroom. It wasn't that she had changed her mind. She couldn't. All she knew was that she had to feed her pet rock. Harper just needed to grab a cloth to put it in her mouth, clamping her jaws down on it to muffle her scream as she let the rock's teeth sink into her flesh, blood trickling down her arm. Nobody saw much of Harper afterwards. Her friends from the shelter would continuously call her cell phone, only to get no reply. She barely paid any attention to the ringing, eventually just letting her phone batteries die and not even bothering to charge it back up. It wasn't important. To her, the only thing that mattered was caring for her pet rock. In Harper's head, it needed to be kept safe and fed, and it was her job to look after it to the best of her ability. She had enough leftover medical supplies that she'd lifted from the shelter. Bandages, antiseptic spray, rubbing alcohol, tranquilizers to treat her wounds. After a while, it almost stopped hurting, knowing that she was helping keep her pet rock fed. Being so emotionally attached to it made all of the pain more bearable. Even when she woke up one morning to find that her rock had rolled off her desk onto her bed, it hardly faced her. Nor did seeing that it had gradually eaten her leg during the night, gnawing through tendons and bone as she slept, leaving her sheets still slick with blood when she awoke. Despite having lost most of her capacity for rational thought, Harper decided it would be best to plan ahead for when she was gone. She knew, through some twisted form of logic, that she wasn't going to last forever. There was only so much of her she'd be able to feed her pet rock for so long. 
Harper held a pen in her hand as best she could with all the fingers she was now missing. She scrawled out a note to whoever found what was left of her in messy, uncoordinated handwriting. Please care for my pet rock. Not everything in this world is exactly as it seems. In fact, there are many creatures in the wild that go out of their way to be deceptive, to disguise themselves as something entirely different from their true nature. Aggressive mimicry refers to a phenomenon in which predators or parasites take on the appearance of something harmless or even appealing in order to lure in their intended prey or host without detection. They might resemble food, an inanimate part of the environment, or even a potential mate. Whatever they choose, they're secretly a wolf in sheep's clothing. In the deep, dark waters of the ocean, the anglerfish dangles an alluring light from its head, ushering in little fish that it can trap in its mouth and devour whole. The alligator snapping turtle wiggles its long tongue like a worm, attracting hungry fish looking for their next meal. Instead, they become the meal for something bigger and more clever than them. False cleaner fish share their appearance of another species, one that helps clean larger fish in a symbiotic relationship. When the imposters find a victim, they swim close under the pretense of cleaning, only to take a bite out of them and swim away. Predators use similar illusions on land too. Anti-mimicking jumping spiders wave their false antenna in the air in an imitation of an ant's movements, isolating the insects from their colony before dragging them back to their lair to be devoured. The mouthparts of the male spiders are shaped like the head of an ant, but this imitation head splits apart to reveal the spider's fangs and its true intentions. The Photorus firefly lights up its body in a mimicry of other firefly species' mating signals, signaling male fireflies looking for companionship. When they respond to the call, however, they will not find a willing mate waiting, but instead a femme fatale of a firefly that just wants to eat. The spider-tailed horned viper has a bulbous tip on its tail, with false legs jutting out on either side. As the snake wiggles its tail, running it across the ground while the rest of its body lies in wait just out of sight, a hungry bird spots it from above. When the bird swoops down to seize the opportunity, the snake reveals itself, snapping up the unfortunate bird before it can escape. Thankfully, humans are so much smarter and more observant than fish, ants, and birds. We're safe from that sort of trickery. There aren't any animals out there who've learned how to look like something familiar, something every day, just to put unsuspecting people at ease and lure us into its waiting jaws. Right? Wrong. Only a couple of years ago, the SCP Foundation discovered a being that has mastered aggressive mimicry on a level previously unseen in the natural world. Unfortunately for us, its prey of choice happens to be humans, and its hunting ground is the very cities where we like to think we're safe from something much bigger, meaner, and hungrier than us. A short video went viral on a popular social media platform. The specific platform has been redacted from official files, but the details of it are clear. A popular creator on the app, a young woman known for her makeup tutorials and restaurant recommendations around her native city of Los Angeles. She was live streaming and answering questions while going about her day when she stepped onto a train at one of the metro stations around the city. The train was extremely crowded, and she was preparing to end the live video, planning to resume once she reached her destination. But just as she went to press the button at the end of the stream, something strange happened. The train went dark, and the space flooded with a strange, thick liquid. The girl screamed in either pain, horror, or both, and dropped the phone. Whatever it fell into must have degraded the phone at an extremely rapid pace because the video feed cut out immediately after a splash. All across social media, people shared the video with one question in mind. What happened on that train? Fans mounted a campaign to find the influencer, to help her if she was in any immediate danger, but there were no leads. Her friends and family said she never came home that day, and when authorities attempted to trace her phone, they could not get any kind of signal. Becoming increasingly concerned about this missing girl and the possibility of some kind of unreported train accident, authorities contacted the Los Angeles Metro and showed them the video footage. But every train was accounted for and in pristine condition. There had been no strange chemical leaks, no crashes, and certainly nothing like what the video appeared to show. 
At the same time, there were missing persons reports being filed all across the country, in every area with a thriving public transportation system. Not only were the occupants of the Los Angeles train unaccounted for, with no wreckage or bodies to be found, but people were disappearing in train stations in New York, Boston, Chicago, Washington, D.C., and more. A woman reported her husband missing after he called her to check in during his daily commute home from work. The train had kept going for much longer than it ordinarily did, drifting off of its usual route. He told her that something was wrong, that he had a terrible feeling of foreboding, and then the call cut off. He never made it home for dinner. A young woman was on her way to start an internship at a prestigious New York City magazine, but never arrived for her first meeting. When her would-be boss reached out to the girl's roommate, all he knew was that she had planned to take the train to work that morning. A private detective trailing a man's wife for him, looking for evidence of an affair, lost track of her when she stepped onto a train downtown. He took the next train, hoping to catch her at what he assumed would be her stop, but she never got off. He wasn't able to track her down, and had to give her suspicious husband the news that his wife had somehow vanished into thin air. It wasn't just one or two people every so often, either. Entire train cars of people were just disappearing, never to be seen again. No matter how hard anyone tried, they could not find any answers. No logical explanation for what could have happened. Fortunately, the video circulated so widely that it made it onto the feed of an SCP Foundation employee who was idly scrolling during a bathroom break. He was so shocked by what he saw that he almost forgot to pull up his pants before running out into the hall. Fortunately, he did remember and rushed to his supervisor's office fully clothed. After determining that the video was not a hoax or some kind of viral marketing oh. stunt intended to sell a new brand of spicy chips, the SCP Foundation decided to launch a formal investigation into anomalous activity involving trains and subway systems around the country. Task forces were set up in every major city, and field researchers were assigned to take the train all day every day as much as possible. As they did, they would maintain communication with the head of their task force, would monitor their findings via hidden cameras and microphones. A week passed without incident, and the Foundation was starting to wonder if somehow the Los Angeles video had been faked when the Chicago task force made a harrowing discovery. Officer Jamie Bauer was assigned to monitor the trains on Chicago's Blue Line, taking the train throughout the day and keeping an eye out for suspicious or potentially anomalous activity. One week in, and he pretty much had it down to a basic routine. He would grab breakfast, hop on the train, and enjoy his coffee and meal while reading a book and riding the train to its last stop. Then he'd pick up lunch and do the same thing all over again. He'd have dinner and repeat. It wasn't too exciting, but then again, excitement in this case probably meant horrors beyond his comprehension. So he was perfectly fine with traversing the city in a subway car and catching up on the backlog of murder mysteries he'd been meaning to read. It was Monday afternoon. He'd picked up a slice of deep dish pizza, excited to try it for the first time, and walked down into the metro station as he took his first bite. Can you try not to chew into your microphone, please? It's gross. Dr. Susan Shepard, the head of the Chicago task force, spoke into Jamie's earpiece. You got it, boss, he said, his mouth full. Thanks. See anything unusual today? She asked. You tell me, you can see the video feed, right? He took another bite, chewing as quietly as he could. Sure, but you're on the ground. Just keep an eye out, okay? Be careful. Remember to draw your weapon if something goes south. Don't just disappear into your book and forget to keep your wits about you. Dr. Shepard sighed. Yep, getting on the train now. Not gonna talk much so these folks don't think I'm nuts. Jamie waited for the doors to open. And just for a moment, noticed that they seemed to stick just a little this time. Nothing to be too worried about, though. Everything looked normal, just as it had on every other ride he'd taken. He could feel the Agatha Christie book calling to him from inside of his tote bag, and he wanted to crack it open and see what clues Hercule Poirot had come across. But Dr. Shepard was right. He'd been slacking off. He needed to pay attention to his surroundings. So he did just that. He watched as the train car steadily filled up with passengers, college students with bags full of books and exhausted expressions, middle-aged people in business attire, tourists wearing souvenir baseball caps and snapping pictures of everything in sight. Before too long, the train was completely packed, and Jamie could barely move without bumping elbows with someone. It was a little claustrophobic, but that was public transportation. Jamie leaned back in his seat, pulled his book out, and focused on the comforting rumble of the engine, the rhythm of the wheels on the tracks. 
Suddenly, without warning, the train screeched to a stop. They were in the middle of a tunnel. Jamie assumed from the darkness that flanked them out the window on either side. Wait, was it dark? Or had the windows just disappeared? He squinted through the blackness and tried to see what was outside, but he couldn't make sense of his surroundings. All around, the other passengers were becoming restless, nervous. Some were calling for help, others were just complaining. Doc, you seeing this? Jamie hissed into the microphone. I don't see a thing, Dr. Shepard replied. Are you alright? Fine, the train's just stalled. I don't know where or what's wrong with it. Jamie began feeling along the walls of the train, looking for doors. Huh, that's weird. What? Well, the crack in the doors, when they come together, should be right here, but it's all smooth. No gaps or anything, like it's all one thing and it feels strange, like... He cut himself off as his stomach dropped, a sudden rush of fear flooding his senses. Like what? Dr. Shepard pressed. Like it's alive, Jamie said shakily. Campbell, what's happening in there? Dr. Shepard began taking furious notes on her hand. I don't know, it's so dark. Everyone's scared, I'm scared. I don't think this is a train. I don't know what it is, but it's nothing good. As Jamie felt around, he smelled something sour, foul, and sharp in his nose. He heard liquid splashing onto the ground, the sound of something sizzling, and then people started to scream. As he felt along the wall, something dripped onto his hand, and then it started to burn. He cried out in agony as whatever had dripped onto him ate away at the skin, dissolving his hand bit by bit. What is it? Dr. Shepard's voice shook as she heard the pain in Jamie's voice. Some kind of acid! Oh god, it's everywhere, it's on the walls, the floors, it just keeps coming. He trailed off. Oh god, oh god, we're in his stomach, whatever this thing is, it's eating us! Campbell, you need to get out of there right now, Dr. Shepard ordered. Draw your weapon, whatever you need to do, just get out! Jamie pulled out his weapon and started firing at the place where the doors should be. But the bullets bounced off uselessly, as if the fleshy material was the side of a tank. He fired until there was no more ammunition left, and then he just kept squeezing the trigger some more out of pure survival instinct. But all it got him was a useless click, and the certainty that the one thing he had brought with him in case of emergency was completely useless. All the while the acid was creeping higher, dripping from every surface, filling the train car until it swallowed the cries for help and the screams of fear and agony. All Dr. Shepard could do was listen helpless as Jamie and the rest of the passengers were digested inside of the massive stomach. What happened to Officer Jamie Campbell was tragic, but it provided important information that the Foundation would likely never have gotten otherwise. They now knew a few key things about this new anomaly. It was some kind of living thing able to disguise itself as a train. It was resilient to bullets and firearms, and it was hiding in plain sight in order to hunt human beings. They had found the culprit for the rash of mysterious disappearances, and it was a race of unidentified creatures capable of taking on the shape of a common underground train. The newfound information quickly circulated throughout the Foundation, making its way to the various task forces assigned to Operation Metro as it had been unofficially nicknamed. Task force members were no longer instructed to board trains. Instead, they would slip hidden cameras onto as many train cars as they possibly could, each outfitted with a tracking device. Then the Foundation could remotely monitor the trains for any potential signs of the mysterious creatures, looking for imposters masquerading as trains, without unnecessarily losing any more operatives in action. Now, as for what they would do once they found one of these massive creatures was still uncertain, but at least they had somewhere to start. The SCP Foundation tried and failed to contain several instances of the carnivorous species before they finally got it right. They attempted to freeze the inside of one train with liquid nitrogen, hoping to incapacitate the creature before it could feed, defend itself, or escape custody. The extreme cold seemed to have no effect, however, and the false train slammed its doors shut at the first sign of discomfort, then sped away at high speed. As it did, the task force members noticed that, though they could hear the sound of wheels on the tracks, they could see legs jutting out of the bottom of the creature, scuttling along the ground. Next, they attempted to take out the creature's legs and render it immobile so that it could be subdued. The legs were resilient to external damage, becoming hard as a rock whenever any weapon, blade, or other implement made contact with them. One task force member tried to physically hold some of the legs in place, but they shifted their shape, becoming appendages resembling tentacles, and threw the man out of the way before the false train hurried out of the tunnel and out of sight. They were then able to track down a predatory train just after a feeding, when it was slightly sluggish after a large meal. 
They pumped an aerosolized poison into the train's interior, the belly of the beast, potent enough to take out a dinosaur, and were relieved to find that the creature was unable to flee. Unfortunately, though they were able to subdue the creature, they killed it in the process. At first, they assumed it was just inactive, but it never resumed activity again. It was just like an ordinary train car, almost. When the interior was touched, it felt warm and slightly pliable, less like metal and plastic, and more like flesh. The longer the creature was still, the more the windows on the side stopped looking like windows and started looking like wide, glassy eyes. The front of the train became a gaping maw, the silhouette of the conductor inside revealed as an extension of the creature's body, resembling a tongue. Survivors and witnesses were given an amnestic to remove any memories of the supposed killer trains running under their city, and the Foundation prepared to bring the dead specimen in for further study. A cover story was used involving massive repairs to the train system, and while the tunnels were closed off, they managed to remove the creature and transport it to a nearby Foundation containment site. There it was given one of the most extensive autopsies in Foundation history, and the first one conducted largely from inside the subject. The autopsy provided a more in-depth look at the nature of the bizarre creature and its curious nature. The creature, nicknamed the Train Eater, referring to its preferred disguise and favorite activity, was one of an apparent species of carnivorous predators that used shape-shifting and an advanced form of aggressive mimicry to prey on commuters, tourists, and anyone else in need of a ride from one place to the next. It would mimic the shape, feel, and sounds of a train, welcoming unassuming victims into its stomach, and once it was completely full and able to efficiently feed, it would release an incredibly potent stomach acid into the compartment and quickly dissolve everything inside. The creature was highly adaptable, able to harden parts of its body at will and display extreme resilience to weapons of any kind. Due to this nearly impenetrable flesh, victims trapped inside would be unable to force their way out. As the research staff turned in their autopsy results and official report, there was a sense of unease in the air as everyone wondered how many of these things are out there, which innocent trip to work might be their last and how on earth could they hope to contain something that could exist in endless numbers, something so expert at hiding in plain sight? There was no realistic way to bring all these creatures into custody, and so they would have to neutralize as many as possible without being detected. Foundation operatives embedded in various city and state governments introduced new measures to renovate public transportation systems, including new sanitation protocols. As part of these protocols, all trains would be sprayed with a high-strength disinfectant before they could be certified for use. In reality, this disinfectant would be the same poison used to take down the first train eater the Foundation studied. Once any and all potent threats had been rendered harmless, trains that were found to be formerly living would be converted into fully functioning trains and allowed to run as normal in order to avoid unnecessary interruptions to the public. In addition to these containment measures, the Foundation monitors all social media for mentions of unusual activity on trains, or mentions of any more missing persons lost at metro stations. The original Los Angeles video that started it all was scrubbed from the internet entirely. So by all means, take advantage of your local public transportation options, but remain vigilant and keep your wits about you. And remember, next time you travel by train, if you see something, say something. More specifically, if you see something unusual on a train, if it looks a little different than it did yesterday, if its sounds don't seem quite right, make sure to let everyone around you know that it is not safe to be here and quickly make your way to the exit. Then, maybe walk to your destination instead. It might make you a little bit late, but hey, better late than dinner. We all have fond memories of the playground. Hours upon hours spent in blissful childhood abandon, racing around the local park, climbing the monkey bars, and seeing if you could get even higher on the swings than your best friend. And then, of course, there's the slide. Who doesn't love a slide? Only you and the force of gravity pulling you down through a straight or spiral tube. Those few seconds of excitement, that rush of not knowing whether you'll come out the other end of the slide or not, that's enough of a thrill for any kid. Of course, you would always come tumbling out of the mouth of the slide every time, at worst with an odd but innocent friction burn on your leg or arm. But what if, one day, you didn't come out of the other end? Or worse, 
What if the place at the end of the slide wasn't the world you left behind when you slid through the entrance? It doesn't seem all that likely to happen, right? Well, you've obviously never taken a trip down SCP-1562, better known as the Tunnel Slide. As its moniker suggests, SCP-1562 is a slide, or it at least appears to be an ordinary tunnel slide. You know, the kind that you would easily find at any kid's park, jungle gym, or indoor play area. Just over two meters high and almost three and a half meters long. And for the most part, it is a completely normal slide. If you were to just sit in it and glide down it feet first, nothing would happen. Then again, if SCP-1562 was an ordinary everyday piece of a playground, then the SCP Foundation would not have such a vested interest in it. They definitely wouldn't be keeping it locked up in quarantine, secured in testing lab 46-V of Site-24. And if any Foundation agents ask, you didn't hear that from us, by the way. The door to the lab is kept locked at all times. No member of personnel is even allowed near the slide unless granted special clearance to do so by Foundation researcher Dr. Carver. So what is it that makes this thing so special? Well, for one, SCP-1562 was first recovered by the Foundation from a defunct, abandoned playground. The location of this playground has been redacted, but it was known to be on the outskirts of a town where a number of young children had been reported missing. Does SCP-1562 contain some sort of clue as to where these children were taken? Perhaps some piece of forensic evidence left behind by a child-snatching anomaly from another dimension? Not quite. SCP-1562 is the thing that took those children. You see, the slide's anomalous properties require very specific circumstances in order to activate. Like we mentioned earlier, if you were just sitting on your butt while you were sliding down it, you would escape unscathed. Laying flat on your back? That is also a safe option. Even flailing yourself about, spinning and rolling and waving your arms, changing position on the way down would mean that nothing anomalous would appear to happen. However, if someone enters SCP-1562 and travels down in head first, laying on their stomach with their arms tucked at their side, almost in a plank position, then that is when strange things start to happen. That is when a person finds out what happened to those missing children. Only about 15 centimeters from the opening of the slide, a person sliding down on their front, head first, with arms by their sides, will disappear right before exiting SCP-1562. In an instant, they will simply be gone, no longer in the slide or even relocated to anywhere nearby. To make matters worse, every single person that this has happened to has never been found again. They literally have vanished off the face of the Earth. Unfortunately, there isn't much that can be done to prevent this. During testing, the Foundation quickly learned that tethering a safety line to a subject does little to stop them from disappearing. They cannot be pulled back from wherever it is that the slide sends them. The rope they are attached to is simply cut and goes slack from the moment that a person is taken by the slide. Now that sounds like the whole story, right? Children are going missing and the Foundation learns it's because of SCP-1562 some kind of interdimensional portal within a playground slide. So they acquire the slide, take it away and keep it locked up securely where it can't cause any more disappearances. End of story. Except that's not quite the end. No, the one thing it's still possible to do once someone has disappeared down the slide is to stay in contact with them. The SCP Foundation has expended a number of test subjects by sending them sliding down SCP-1562 just to learn what's on the other side. Just where does the slide take them? Luckily, tests like this are precisely what the Foundation has D-Class personnel for. So what happened when the Foundation sent some D-Classes on a one-way joyride down the slide? Well, one test involved a D-Class designated D-2445 who disappeared into SCP-1562 but was given a two-way radio to communicate directly with Dr. Deritz, one of the research staff. D-2445 reported that he felt himself in a small cramped tunnel and quickly requested to be let back out. Dr. Deritz had neglected to tell D-2445 that was impossible and that no one ever came back from inside the slide. While it was too dark to see anything, the prisoner described still being laid on his front, but feeling like there were rocks or dirt surrounding him on all sides. 
Realizing that he barely had enough room to move or even lift his head, D2445 again requested to be let out of SCP-1562. As the unfortunate D-Class grew increasingly more unsettled by the movement-restricting environment, Dr. Derritz revealed that the lifeline tethering D2445 back to the Foundation had been severed upon their disappearance into the slide. Panicking, D2445 managed to move forward slightly and realized that his head had hit something. A shoe. A tiny child's shoe. Communication with D2445 was called to a halt, and the Foundation's researchers discussed possible ways that they could retrieve the prisoner. Although most of them probably knew at this point that this task was likely impossible, this test may have taken place before the Foundation realized that return from SCP-1562 was impossible. The plan was that another D-Class would be sent into the slide. Once again, they would be attached to a tether line and be carrying video and audio recording equipment, along with a GPS tracker and a headlamp. Reaching out to D2445, Dr. Derritz relayed this plan to him. D2445 immediately begged to be set free from SCP-1562, as the doctor attempted to calm him down, but to little effect. Something had scared him, truly terrified him. A sound coming from somewhere within the tunnel. It, it started talking, D2445 claimed. When Dr. Derritz asked for clarity, the D-Class replied saying that a little boy had tried to speak to him, but that the child had made little sense. He just kept asking where he was, and I told him I didn't know, but I don't think he was really talking to me, because he didn't respond to my voice, and he told me to stop crying when I was actually sort of calm. When asked if this child had moved at all, D2445 said that he was unsure. He started screaming and I told him to shut up, but he just kept screaming and crying and asking for his mommy, and then he finally stopped. And shortly after that, you've contacted me again. <laughs> Please get me out now. Dr. Derritz tried to reassure the man to little avail, and communication with D2445 was cut off after he claimed something was wrong with his chest. Shortly after the Foundation lost communication with D2445, another member of D-Class was sent into the slide after him. This subject, referred to officially as D-8600, had been specifically selected for this task thanks to his small stature. Dr. Derritz and the other Foundation researchers testing SCP-1562 believed that the man's thinner body type would allow D-8600 to better navigate the tunnel that the slides seemed to transport people to. And you can probably guess what happened next. Just like all the others that had been sent down the slide, D-8600 was trapped. His lifeline was cut the moment that he vanished inside the tunnel slide. On top of this, the GPS tracker that this thinner D-Class had been issued with seemed to not be working properly. Its signal could not be correctly traced, and without an accurate fix, there was no way to determine the location to which SCP-1562 was transporting its victims, if it was even in this universe. Additionally, the video feed from the camera D-8600 was carrying also failed to connect, with only audio from his radio being recovered by the research team. Contacting D-8600, Dr. Derritz was informed by this new D-Class that his headlamp had stopped working the second he had arrived in the same cave or tunnel as earlier test subjects. Before long, by shimmying through the area on his arms, D-8600 bumped into a foot, believed to be belonging to D-2445. While he could barely see anything, D-8600 could hear D-2445's voice, and this was being faintly picked up via his radio. However, as he and Dr. Derritz tried to talk to the first prisoner, his words began to sound all too familiar. I don't know, some sort of very small tunnel. It's really cramped. Can you get me out now? Followed by, no, it's, it's too dark, I can't see anything, and I'm stuck. It was all just a recording from what D2445 had said when he first arrived after SCP-1562 had sent him into the tunnel. D-8600 did not realize this at first and attempted to help his fellow prisoner, hoping to pull him out of wherever they were trapped. Dr. Derritz tried desperately to explain that D-2445 was just repeating his half of an earlier conversation, but D-8600 hardly noticed that was the case. He gripped the other D-Class's ankles and told the doctor to pull them out of the tunnel. The doctor revealed that once again the tether line had been severed, 
but D-8600 refused to believe that escape was impossible. He tried to worm his way back the way he had come, leaving D-2445 still repeating his words from earlier. He just kept asking me where he was and I told him I didn't know, but I don't think he was really talking to me because he didn't respond to my voice and he told me to stop crying when I was actually sort of calm. I don't think so. He started screaming and I told him to shut up, but he kept just screaming and crying and asking for his mommy. Then he finally stopped and shortly after that you contacted me again. Please get me out now. Please hurry, my chest is really starting to hurt. After yelling at him to stop talking multiple times, D-8600 noted that D-2445 had finally gone quiet. The D-Class also remarked that the air was starting to taste stale and hoped that there would be enough oxygen for him to get back. Then, just like his predecessor, communication with D-8600 came to an abrupt stop. Dr. Derritz was no longer able to reach him on the radio. There was nothing but static. The Foundation was unable to re-establish contact with either of the two D-Class personnel lost inside SCP-1562, and any future testing of the tunnel slide was suspended. To this day, none of us know what exactly happened to the victims of the tunnel slide. Where were they taken? What? had taken them. What was making the prior victims repeat their ominous words? As horror author Stephen King once put it, it's the unanswered questions that stays with us the longest. But the next time you decide to thrill your inner child by taking a jaunt to your local kitty park, you may just find out for yourself. Being a video archivist for the SCP Foundation is one of the easiest jobs in the entire organization. You're responsible for viewing every tape found in the field, every interview with an anomaly, and every event log recorded by a mobile task force. If something passes your desk, that means the Foundation's going to want its contents viewed, transcribed, and the original source footage stored for preservation. Compared to the doctors working tirelessly to push their research to the boundaries of understood science and field agents risking their lives elsewhere, your job of lounging in an air-conditioned room, sitting at a computer, and watching videos all day seems pretty appealing. At least on paper it does. When you take into account just what it is you'll be transcribing, the grim realities present in all Foundation careers starts to emerge in your deceptively cushy office gig. It's no secret that the Foundation's visual logs describe unspeakable horrors within, disgusting body alterations, gory details, and terrifying imagery are mainstays of Foundation files. Most are never conscious of the fact that every log that's been written out had to have been viewed by someone in the first place. Those blank redacted areas where your imagination has to fill in the details? Somewhere, someone in the Foundation had to describe that sensitive information in the first place. That gruesome kill in the task force report? The visual archivists saw the footage before they wrote it out. Sure, your job might be to watch the Foundation's home movies all day, but due to the sheer amount of visual materials the Foundation needs to transcribe and catalog, you'll be on average seeing far more horrors than the typical researcher or task force member. Instead of being assigned to one or two projects at a time, you'll witness an infinite slew of footage from across the Foundation's history. You'll just be viewing all of the horror from a distance, behind a screen, after the fact. But you don't need to be told that. You're a professional, hard-boiled, grizzled veteran of the Foundation. You watch hours of footage a day, transcribe it, archive it, and send it out to be inserted in the various articles and files in the Foundation database. You've lived through countless task force missions, observed endless testing logs, and seen everything from unimaginable entities to the bloodiest events ever taken place. It used to keep you up at night, but at this point you're desensitized to almost anything the world can throw at you. Maybe that's why you were the Foundation's latest choice to transcribe the footage recovered from the site of SCP-6670. You'd heard the stories. A series of tapes the other archivists were flat out refusing to transcribe due to sheer disgust and horror. They'd been passed down the line two or three times, and now they came to you. In a box of literal VHS tapes labeled with a strip of tape that read SCP-6670 Recovered Media. You didn't doubt that whatever was on these was intense, since it was enough to get a few Foundation archivists to pass, something that rarely happens. But you were sure they weren't anything you couldn't handle. 
You inspect the box for a manifest paper to see if you can gain any other information about the tapes. Most of the time, the varying parts of the Foundation's research is kept heavily indiscernible from one another. The right hand never knows what the left is doing. So getting any further context to the footage you're about to review is oftentimes necessary. But the paper inserted on top of the box doesn't reveal much. It reads, Footage recovered from the discovery site of SCP-6670, Containment Site 86, Detroit, Michigan. That's about as much as you're going to get, but at least it's something. You take the tape that says first on it and pop it into the VCR. Yeah, you had to dust off that old dinosaur just for this. The real anomaly is that it still works after all these years. The first tape is overlaid with a title that takes up the entirety of the screen. Happy Birthday Gemma, 1988, it reads. The camera pans to a small infant laying down on a cushion. You can tell from the brief glimpses of the background that the house is dilapidated, poorly held together. Not the conditions a child should be raised in, but an unfortunate reality that some face. The baby stares at the camera, wiggling and making adorable baby noises. You wonder if this is Gemma, the birthday girl herself. Your thoughts are confirmed by the camera holder, who plays with and tickles Gemma, celebrating her birthday. The camera holder asks the baby to smile for mommy, which the little Gemma gleefully does. Of course, the one holding the camera is Gemma's mother, and the two are celebrating her first birthday. The rest of the tape is ordinary, with Gemma and her mother playing and laughing together. Her mother sings happy birthday to her, and the recording stops. Well, that wasn't so bad, you think to yourself. In fact, taking into account most of the stuff that passes your desk, that was pretty good. But that was only the first tape. You're intrinsically drawn to the next one, wondering how this could possibly inspire so much fear in the others who watched it. Second tape. The shot opens up with a woman dressed in a slightly tattered, sewn-together formal attire. She's filming herself standing before a mirror. The title reads, Job Interview Practice Tape. After the title disappears, she begins talking to herself. She reveals her name, Melanie Jamie G. Parker, and acts as if she's applying to a job specifically to an internship at the Walter Media Broadcast Company. You can tell from the sound of her voice that this is Gemma's mother. Melanie's mock interview proceeds slowly. She's visibly apprehensive, chokes over her words, and seems to be in great distress. Melanie mentions that she turned 18 the other day, and that she's interested in applying for a job as a news reporter. Still, she can't get the words out properly, stuttering and hesitating. She's clearly distracted by something off-camera. Midway through her rehearsal, the sound of high-pitched crying is heard. It's the baby. Melanie assures Gemma that she's coming, and leans over to hit the button to stop the recording before rushing off to calm down the crying child. Again, nothing horrible, you think. It's difficult to watch someone so young struggle with the challenges of motherhood, but it hasn't made you lose your lunch or anything. You take out the third tape, pop it in, and see what happens next. Another title, A Letter to My Family, Cut This. Seems like it was intended to be thrown out. The picture comes in, showing a crying Melanie, sitting on the edge of her bed in a white gown. Sniffling up her tears, Melanie delivers a message intended to be viewed by her family. You learn that her relationship with them is unstable, and that Melanie has been on her own for months, potentially longer. She musters out an apology to her parents, saying that she's sorry about everything, for a party, for stealing their money. She continues to cry, but tells them that she wants them to know that she's sorry and that she loves them. She addresses her sister's caring attitude and her mother's smile, but is hesitant to compliment her father. She reveals that she hasn't spoken to them in two years, but she can't go any longer. She's barely been able to afford basic necessities, and despite applying for as many jobs as she could, she hasn't landed one. Her personal savings are almost depleted, and she can't sleep at night. Gemma's getting bigger, a lot bigger than any girl should be at two. She's rapidly outgrowing her clothes, and Melanie's unable to provide her with the love and care that she needs. She's halfway through, saying that she wants her parents to take custody of Gemma, but she stops. She can't get herself to admit it. She stares at the camera, shakes her head, and begins cursing. Melanie's voice gets louder, 
and she vehemently defends her decision to keep Gemma for herself. She's not subjecting herself to her family, who she clearly despises. Melanie continues to lash out against her family, saying that she's tired of them, and that they will never find her and Gemma. She's visibly shaking, her voice unstable. Melanie's made her decision. Gemma's staying with her. She makes a statement. You should have seen how happy Gemma and I were. How nice life is out here. The sun's so much brighter. There's no, no fighting, no screaming, no crying. I took my daughter and I left all of you. And I am happy. In the background, Gemma's crying is heard again from another room. Melanie Drain looks in the distance, surprised to hear that she's awake. She wipes the tears from her eyes and assures Gemma that her mother will be right there. She forgets to turn the camera off and rushes out of the room. For the rest of the tape lasting nearly two hours in duration, Melanie calms Gemma, holding her and assuring her that she's safe. Eventually, the camera's battery gives out and the recording stops. So far, it's definitely upsetting to see, but you haven't encountered anything anomalous yet. Maybe it's the fourth tape that will shed some light on what's going on here. You put it in and prepare for the worst. This tape cuts in immediately without a title. Gemma and Melanie are playing together in Melanie's bedroom. What she said about Gemma's growth is two. She's only two, but she stands at four feet tall with long and disheveled blonde hair. Gemma runs across the bedroom, making noises and pretending to be an airplane. Melanie, for once, doesn't seem to be stressed, though she looks visibly tired. The sound of a phone ringing is heard in the background. Melanie immediately snaps out of her happy attitude and runs off to answer it. While she talks on the phone, Gemma is seen peering into a small hole in the wall of the bedroom. She then moves off screen. While Melanie is talking on the phone, Gemma tries to get her mother's attention. When Melanie hangs up, she notices that she doesn't see her daughter anywhere and begins frantically searching. Gemma answers, her voice coming from inside the hole in the wall. Melanie tries to goad her child from outside the wall, but Gemma doesn't listen. Eventually, she hears a loud snap and then a scream. Melanie panics, moving her head into the hole. Gemma cries, screaming that she's in pain and that she hurt something. Melanie tells her that she'll get help and desperately tries not to panic. She runs off screen, and for 15 minutes, all that's heard is Gemma crying. Melanie returns with a young man who would later be identified as her neighbor, John Bates. He carries a rope. Melanie directs Bates to a hole in the wall. The two are clearly familiar with one another, and Melanie assures Gemma that Mr. John is going to help her out of the hole. Bates kneels on the floor and inserts his head into the wall, feeding the rope inside the hole. On the count of three, they tell Gemma to grab the rope and they'll pull. Seconds pass without a response, and suddenly Bates feels a tug. She's grabbing the rope. Melanie and Bates pull together, hoping to lift Gemma out of wherever she fell, but the girl won't move. She continues to cry, saying that she's stuck, and neither Bates nor Melanie can get her to budge. Melanie, who is now crying, assures Gemma that they'll get her out, while Bates is more reluctant. Bates tells her that they aren't going to be able to get her out by themselves, and the two begin to argue loudly. They agree to call the fire department. After all, they're specialized in getting people out of confined spaces. Bates tries calling, but the lines are full. Meanwhile, Melanie continues to lose hope. Bates insists that they have to call 911, but Melanie knows that she doesn't have enough to cover medical costs, and if they discover the living conditions that Gemma's been in, they'll surely take her child away. The two continue to argue. Bates suggests that Melanie phones her family, which is the ultimate breaking point for her. From off screen, you can hear a struggle, the sound of a cupboard opening, and then Bates hitting the floor. 30 minutes of silence follow. When Melanie returns, she's caked in dirt, grease, and blood. What happened was evident. Melanie sticks her head inside the hole in the wall and assures Gemma that her mother will take care of her. The next day pulls you in. The title displays Happy Birthday Gemma, 1991. You recognize that the video is being taken from inside the wall. There's a small lava lamp and a cupcake with a candle in front of Gemma, who lays prone on the ground. She's more pale than before and looks to be about five feet tall now, and her shoulders encompass the length of the space. From behind the camera, 
Melanie sings to her, and Gemma blows out the candle. The recording stops. Another tape. Happy Birthday Gemma, 1993. Gemma's looking visibly ill. Her eyes droop, she smiles tiredly, and her body seems to be larger than the space it's confined to. A cake sits in front of her with five candles. Melanie sings to her again. The 1997 birthday tape is even worse. Gemma is about seven feet tall, and her face encompasses the entire hole with no discernible head. Melanie sings to Gemma, who just wants to eat her cake. The sound of Gemma's bones clinking and cracking as her body contorts to the tight space is heard. The next tape is unlabeled, but the foundation determined it to be recorded around 2001. Melanie sits outside the door to her bedroom, sobbing. Her bedroom is entirely inaccessible. Behind the door, the cracking of bones is heard throughout the house. She's singing happy birthday to Gemma, who is unseen. Gemma's voice can be heard begging for food. Another crack, this time from the ceiling. Dust falls from above. The house is giving out. Gemma screams that she's in pain and that she doesn't want to fall. The cracking gets louder and before Melanie can finish singing, she's taken back by the horror of the situation. Gemma begs for her mother to help her and that her back hurts. The ceiling's about to give out any second, and suddenly, it does. The camera tips showing a ceiling full of cracks, which gives out over the next few seconds. Melanie screams that she'll catch Gemma, but she is simply too big. Her form is revealed. A block of barely human skin and tissue, shaped into a square mass due to being confined to the walls for years. You can't tell that the entity before you is still human, and most of all an injured, scared child. Gemma's anomalous growth when confined to such a small space over a long period of time resulted in this. Gemma falls to the floor, crushing Melanie in the process. For the remaining four hours of the tape, Gemma sifts and struggles, all while crying out for her mother. The tape stops. Disturbed by the content, you know you're going to feel sick transcribing these tapes. You check the corresponding database file for SCP-6670 in hopes you can access it. Thankfully, it's within your clearance, and all is illuminated when you read what's already there. SCP-6670 is Gemma, described as a large amorphous entity made of flesh, tissue, and contorted bones. SCP-6670 is confined to a small house in Detroit, Michigan, where it's been contained on site with a concrete wall constructed around the home. SCP-6670 was discovered following the recording of the tape. When passers-by outside the house described the structure as breathing, after which containment measures were implemented and research began. The only access point to SCP-6670 is through the doorway outside the bedroom, as most of the house's structure is either destroyed or taken up by SCP-6670's mass. X-ray scans revealed that SCP-6670's spine is extremely contorted and is assumed to have grown along the dimensions of the home, with puberty assumed to have accelerated the growing process. SCP-6670 is largely immobile and is believed to be hibernating. Its intelligence seems to be roughly equivalent to a small child. Inside the home, the tapes were found, and the file describes them as awaiting transcription, which is your job. Beneath the section intended for your work is an event log, transcribed by personnel working on site with SCP-6670. The entity, after remaining immobile for so long, had eventually moved. The log read as follows. The entity rolled in front of the camera, where its mouth could be seen. It's surrounded by several strings of rotting flesh and caked with blood. The teeth are rotten, consistent with typical patterns of tooth decay. A clump of black hair clings to the side of its lower lip. SCP-6670 is heard speaking. The camera registers the sound as similar to, Mama, I'm hungry. Its voice is that of a young girl. You're taken back by the graphic bodily alteration described. When the realization hits you that you're going to have to watch these tapes multiple times over to ensure proper transcription. But then, one other thing stands out. A clump of black hair on SCP-6670's lip, but Gemma had blonde hair, and then it hits you. You know that you'll be in for many sleepless nights after this is all said and done. Ask anyone that has been through it, and they'll all tell you the same.
that moving home is maybe one of the most stressful things that a normal person can ever experience. It's a logistical nightmare right from the start. The moment you talk to a realtor about being interested in selling your current house and buying another, everything goes downhill from there. After that moment, an avalanche of things comes hurtling towards you. Finding a place you like, making an offer, letting people look around your house, waiting for them to make a counteroffer, exchanging contracts, and that's before you even have thought about packing. And as Milo had learned, doing all of that on your own only makes the stress of moving feel all the more potent. But he had finally made it. After a constant back and forth with his realtor, the time had come for him to pack up all of his worldly possessions and relocate to a brand new place to call home. He had felt it was long overdue for him to get a change of scenery, and luckily just the right place had come onto the market to answer that call. It was a pretty big house, bigger than Milo's previous home, but considerably cheaper. In fact, he thought it had been significantly undervalued. The house had an almost Victorian-era feel to it, all beautifully carved and varnished woodwork and creaky old floorboards, but in more of an elegant, refined sort of way, rather than a creepier one. That's not to say Milo's new place wasn't without its more unsettling elements. Aside from being big, spacious, and easy to imagine as being haunted, the creepiest thing about the house, aside from its frighteningly low price, was the story of what happened to the previous owners. Obviously, you know that legally we have to disclose whether or not anyone died on this property, the realtor had explained, wearing a forced grin as she showed Milo around the house. Hearing that sentence, he could feel the hairs on the back of his neck stand up. Someone died here? He asked in disbelief. No, 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 of course not, sir. The realtor instantly walked back her statement less in an effort to ease her client's nerves, but more to ensure that she still closed the deal and earned her commission bonus. Then why the hell would you start a sentence like that? Milo asked. We just have to give full disclosure, but I assure you, the previous residents didn't die on the grounds of this house. She gave that fake smile again. It was pretty ineffectual at reassuring him. So what happened to the last owner? Well, it's a bit of a mystery to be honest. A local legend if you like. But hey, that gives the place more flavor, hearing some spooky history, right? Think of what a conversation starter that will be. The realtor ended her sentence with a forced snorting laugh, but reined it back in when she realized Milo wasn't laughing with her. Ah, as far as I know, there used to be an older couple living here, the Shaws. They were apparently very quiet, reclusive, kept to themselves a lot, I'm sure you know the type. Milo couldn't help but notice she shot him a look as she said that part, as if she was silently passing judgment on the fact he was planning on moving in alone. But they used to spend a lot of time tending the garden out front, so their neighbors would see them pretty frequently, which meant they were all okay and no one had any bad mishaps in the house. You know how old folks can be, such a worry when they get to that age. Yeah, totally. Milo interjected, aware the realtor was stalling. He repeated, So, what actually happened to them? Well, that's the thing, she shrugged. Nobody knows the full story. One day, the neighbors across the street noticed they hadn't seen Mr. and Mrs. Shaw for quite a while, so naturally they came on over here to see if they were in, and the last thing they wanted was to assume everything was hunky-dory here. I mean, hey, better safe than sorry, right? But once they got inside, they couldn't find either of them. Mr. and Mrs. Shaw were just gone, vanished without a trace. Most people on the street thought they had just sold the place, kept it quiet and moved away, retired to somewhere nice and exotic. Oh, well, that sounds nice, I suppose. Milo replied, relieved to hear that there hadn't been any brutal unsolved murders in the house, and that it most likely wasn't haunted. That's just what the neighbors think anyway, the realtor continued. Of course, they hadn't sold the house, they just left it. When my firm came in to repossess the place, it had all their belongings in it. Some might even still be laying around here. Uh, anyway, did you want to have a look at that contract? Well, strictly speaking, Milo was the only human living in his new house. He was never fully alone. He had arrived with his two closest friends, a pair of pets he had adopted while living in his old house. One was a hamster by the name of Donut, named after his round little body, and the golden brown shade of his fur had reminded Milo of the glazed sugary baked treat. The other was Pixel, a bearded dragon with a pattern on his scales that resembled some kind of mosaic art. The first order of business Milo had decided was before even unpacking, he needed to make sure his scaly and furry friends each had a suitable place to stay 
and that he got them fed. Little did he realize there was something else living in the house with them, something that was far bigger and was getting much hungrier than either of his pets would. Looking around the house, Milo stumbled across a few boxes that he hadn't brought with him. Like the realtor had said, the Shahs still had some of their possessions left lying around the place. Most of it was useless to Milo. Old man's clothes or a set of knitting needles and rolls of colorful thread, it was those particular clues that seemed to imply Mrs. Shaw had a lot of free time on her hands and maybe took up knitting as a hobby during retirement. Of course, the bigger clue was the huge handmade blanket that Milo found draped over some of the remaining boxes in the attic. He wasn't exactly well-versed in knitwear, but he could appreciate the craft behind this soft blanket. It clearly had a lot of time and effort put into making it, painstakingly knitting each and every individual thread, looping it around a pair of steel needles and eventually, after hours of wearing out shaking, bony fingers, produce something that actually looked quite nice. Even though the idea of sitting and knitting a blanket might have been one of the most boring uses of time Milo could imagine, he still had to admit he was surprised that the Shahs had left this particular piece of bedding behind. It seemed like it would be pretty comfy to sleep under. It might help keep a person warm at night now that the colder seasons were approaching. What's more was that the blanket was clean, almost like it had been freshly washed. There was no old person smell on it, no dirt or discoloration, not a stain and it hadn't even accumulated any dust in its fibers. In fact, he noticed that there was hardly any dust at all up in the attic, despite the house being empty for so long. He assumed the realtors had hired someone as a caretaker while they found a buyer for the place, and they had kept the place clean. After all, what other conclusion could they have possibly drawn? It's not as if something had eaten all the dust. That would be absurd. He'd have a sort through of the Shaw's leftovers later, maybe sell some of it off at a local yard sale or give it to a thrift store. But that blanket might come in handy when it started snowing, so Milo had half a mind to keep it. Now, part of what makes moving home such a stressful life experience isn't just all the logistical and administrative parts of the process. It's only made worse by the fact that it takes forever to move into a new house fully. That's the part everyone always forgets about. The months after a move, when you're forced to live amongst towers of cardboard boxes, all your worldly possessions buried deep within them, and you can never remember which crate anything is in when you urgently need it. So realizing it would take him much longer to unpack all of his things, Milo set about making sure he had everything that Donut and Pixel would need already to hand. The latter of his two pets, the bearded dragon, usually spent most of his days in a spacious glass tank. Milo didn't love the idea of keeping either of his two best buds so confined, but Pixel never went very far anyway, content to lay under a heat lamp almost perfectly still for most of the day. Donut, on the other hand, was much more of a free spirit. The tiny brown hamster physically could not stay still, and most days seemed to be filled with more energy than Milo was. As a result, he let the little guy roll about inside a little plastic ball all day long, until his little hamster feet gave out. And now, Donut had much more space to zip around inside his ball, so while he entertained himself, Milo could focus on what needed fixing, cleaning, and generally improving around the house. It didn't take him long to realize, however, that the realtors had pulled a bit of a fast one on him. Despite the absolute steal of a price that Milo had been offered, it quickly became clear that the unknown fate of the previous residence wasn't the only detail about the house that had been conveniently kept hidden. The place was in dire need of repair, with a lot of the old woodwork rapidly rotting away. If left unchecked, parts of the house could collapse and come apart at the seams. To make matters worse, the boiler was an ancient iron monstrosity that was barely able to produce warm water, which would quickly become an even bigger problem when the weather started to get colder. Then, to top off the trifecta of unforeseen issues and teething problems with his new place, Milo couldn't sleep. It was to be expected. After all, the house was old, worn out, and had definitely seen better days. There were bound to be a few noises, the odd creak coming from upstairs when Milo and his two pets were all downstairs, the tapping of branches against windows blowing in the wind outside. But for some reason, every audible disturbance that emanated from some hidden corner of the building only seemed to get a thousand times louder when the sun went down. At nighttime, every squeaky floorboard or random noise of the house settling was nearly deafening, enough to pull Milo right out of what little restless sleep he was getting. The worst part about it was, though he couldn't help it, 
it made him feel unwelcome, as if Mr. and Mrs. Shaw were angered that he had moved in. In the dark, it was hard not to picture every sound as one or both of the old couple creeping through the corridors, coming to reclaim their home and remove Milo from the premises. One night, the noises started invading what little sleep Milo did manage to get, spilling into his dream and causing them to devolve into unsettling nightmares. There was an old photograph in a frame that he had come across in the personal effects left behind by the Shaws, showing the pair of them staring disapprovingly out of the image at him. Now, thanks to the creaking wooden structure of the house and the sounds it made at night, Milo was seeing the old couple in every bad dream he had. Both their faces were locked in those same still, frozen expressions of contempt as they tried to exercise him like an interloper on their property. That was the final nail in the coffin that made Milo realize he needed to look at other options. Surely there had to be some way to induce a deep enough sleep so that the sounds the house was making weren't keeping him up or incepting nightmares anymore. He called the local doctor, arranging a consultation for later that day. As he hung up the phone, something nudged against his foot. It was Donut, having rolled through the maze of cardboard boxes still filling the house. Milo took one look at the little brown furred hamster than the crates that still littered the place. Grabbing the leftover items that the Shads had forgotten to take with them before they vanished, Milo moved those boxes out into the shed. He knew he was probably reaching, that it was hard likely to make even the slightest difference to his sleeping, but maybe keeping their stuff away from him would keep the old couple out of his head. The only thing he kept in the house was the blanket. There was no use letting it go to waste, especially knowing that the boiler was on the blink and it would be cold soon. He rolled it up and left it on his bed, leaving his more mobile pet in the same room before heading out to see the doctor. When Milo got back, a bottle of prescription sleeping pills in his pocket, he couldn't help but notice his room seemed different. The blanket looked like it had fallen off the bed and onto the floor for one, but more worryingly, Donut's plastic travel ball had been split open laying in pieces on the ground, with its furry little occupant nowhere to be seen. Over the next few hours, Milo searched every corner of the house, calling out to his hamster, trying to lure it back with more morsels of food. But Donut didn't seem to be anywhere. He wasn't even underneath the knitted blanket. Still, there was no sign. As worry set in, Milo hurriedly checked Pixel's cage to see if he was gone too, but the lizard was relaxing, as lethargic as ever, completely unfazed by what was going on. It certainly seemed that when it rained, it really poured in this new house. Just as he was searching for his missing hamster, Milo heard a new, horrible sound echo through the corridors. This one wasn't so much a scary noise, even if it did make him jump, but it was more the inconvenience that came with it. Finally, giving out after God knows how many years it had been installed for, the house's boiler burst. Spending the afternoon into the evening failing to track down one of his missing pets and stopping the huge iron cast boiler from flooding the basement wasn't exactly what Milo had in mind for fun activities to do when he got home. Going to bed frustrated made it as hard to sleep as all the nightly cacophony of creaking floorboards and branches raking against the windows. He tapped out two of the pills the doctor had prescribed him, knocking them back with a sharp motion of his head and a swig of cold water before laying back in bed. As night had fallen, the temperature also had plummeted too. Not having a boiler to heat his room meant that Milo couldn't stop himself from shivering in the cold, his breath forming clouds in front of his face. He reached for the knitted blanket and threw it over himself, curling up underneath it to try and provide an extra layer of warmth to protect himself from the gnawing cold. The pills did as they were meant to, helping Milo to quickly sleep into a much deeper sleep than he had experienced in a while. Although it didn't seem to help the nightmares, Mr. and Mrs. Shaw came back again. This time they had Milo's arms and legs tied up. With their matching disapproving faces, the elderly couple threw something over their helpless victim and tried to smother him to death. For a dream, it felt so intense, so real. Milo could feel a heavy weight on top of his body as he slept. In fact, it felt like it was all around him, engulfing and crushing the life out of him from all sides. But it was the feeling of something wet against his arm, the sensation of liquid against his skin, and the numbness where his hand should be were what finally pulled him out of the dream and into the nightmare. Through the dark and his cloudy vision, Milo could see a wide, gaping maw filled with teeth. The feeling of being crushed was still surrounding him, 
and despite kicking his legs and trying to free himself from confinement, it didn't stop squeezing him tighter. His panic was already making it harder to catch his breath, but now he could barely fill his lungs enough to scream for help. Not that anyone was around to hear him, but it was the sight of his arm that chilled Milo's blood. It wasn't there anymore. Part of it just above the elbow was just gone. His hand, fingers, every internal bone and muscle had been reduced to a bloody mess, a slurry of red melting and coming apart. It was runny, little more than a liquid resembling the consistency of sand when it's underwater and becomes sludge. Most of his flesh was liquefied, going further up his arm, and as the blanket pulled its prey into its mouth, until Milo was no more, not a trace of him left, just like the previous owners. Little did Milo or the Shaws and Donut before him know, but he'd been the victim of a creature that was part of a rather unique species. While they will often vary in size, shape, pattern, and other aspects of their appearance, SCP-799 always seem to be ordinary items of knitted bedwear, at least at first. They retain heat like a normal blanket would, and are soft to the touch, and for the most part, don't seem directly harmful. And usually, they aren't. SCP-799s are incapable of much movement, instead laying still a lot of time, not unlike a certain bearded dragon that just lost its owner. They also don't seem to require much in the way of food, extracting what little nutrition they do need by drawing in household dust. A lot of the organic matter in dust is comprised of dead and discarded human hair and skin cells, so this makes sense. This feeding is all done through filtered mouths in the fibers. However, this changes if an SCP-799 blanket is forced to go on a long time without food. While they possess this biological trait themselves, SCP-799 don't seem to regard cold-blooded animals to be the source of food. In fact, they don't even seem to be able to detect other creatures with cold blood, such as reptiles. Instead, SCP-799 will metamorphose into a more predatory form in order to consume any warm-blooded mammal or human being it encounters, transforming its feeding orifices and digestive tract into a singular mouth lined with several rolls of sharp, pointed teeth. From there, it will wrap up the largest warm-blooded animal it can find, whether that be a hamster or a grown man and will tear off parts of its prey, reducing them to little more than a thin slurry as it digests their body mass to feed itself. So if you move into a new house and come across an old knitted blanket, maybe consider throwing it out, if you want to live. Now go and check out SCP-3032 and then it was an angry spider. For more warnings about everyday objects that can seem harmless at first, but will quickly turn deadly when you least expect it. And after that, if you're in the market for a piece of anomalous furniture that's still soft and cozy like the blanket, but nowhere near as dangerous, then SCP-3832 Surprise Pillow Fight might be just what you need.